it finally dropped. It dropped. Grounded to the making of The Last of Us Part Two. We're going to see if this gets us copyright struck immediately, okay? We're going to see. I don't know. I'm kind of braced for it. Let's see. I'm excited, though. I've been waiting for this for, like, years. I've wanted them to do this documentary for so long. In 2016, Naughty Dog and PlayStation, registered trademark, began production on a documentary about The Making of The Last of Us Part Two. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the footage had been left unedited until now. I'm glad they did something with it. I'm also... I'm surprised that they didn't edit it during COVID. You'd think if any time would have been perfect to cut that footage together, it would be COVID, but. Wires. There's Naughty Dog. That's what it looks like. In case you were ever wondering. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you all for what is about to be a very long presentation. Uh, so he looks so much better with Anthony the and I ran some numbers, and to our best guess, uh, The Last of Us Part Two is ten to thirty percent longer than The Last of Us Part One. However, this is the most detailed story presentation we've ever done. Like, if you think about the presentation for T One, where we kind of talk about the quarantine zone in somewhat detail, even though most of it changed, and then it's like, and here are some things that might happen with Joel and Ellie. They might go into a spore filled subway tunnel. They might fight some cannibals. Uh, at some point, Joel will get incapacitated. And it'll, this has everything figured out, uh, even though it might change. Um, every character is accounted for, every cinematic is accounted for in this presentation, which means it's gonna feel twice as long as the first game. It ended up being like twice as long, like a little more, I think, right? So when you freak out, that's normal. That's part of this. Oh, this is about an hour and a half to two hours. So hopefully you got your pee break. Okay. Um, so we open on 15 year old Ellie. This is a few weeks after the events of the first game. It's crazy that they actually filmed like the first meeting of him sharing the game with everybody. There's a doorway leading down to this basement and Ellie sees Tommy, and he's just finished climbing out of this basement, and he's hurt bad, and he's rambling about something needed to go after these people. Ellie's trying to ask him, what happened? Where's Joel? And he doesn't make any sense to her, and she starts to go downstairs. Tommy grabs her hand and tries to stop her, but he's too weak. She rips her arm away, and she heads down. And with each step, her heart races faster and faster. She sees this trail of blood. She opens the door, revealing Joel's mutilated body. And then shock just sets in and she screams and tries to grab his body and Dina comes and rips her away and on that cacophony of sounds, silence. Oh, we're just getting started. <laughs> just a few weeks after the end of the first game, so not years and years later. It doesn't need a sequel. This has been my stance for a long time. I felt like the danger with a lot of creative types is that they often get involved when they shouldn't. Like George Lucas with the prequels, uh, going back to it, like I don't know if they really added that much that like needed to be added. And then also like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg remastering and redoing special effects and animations and re-editing stuff from the originals. Like, just calm down, leave it be. Sometimes these things are good the way they are. Everybody loves it. Don't screw it up. You know, just leave it be. Leave it be. It's the same thing with Harry Potter. Harry Potter, you're good. We don't need the crimes of Grindelwald gibble smack. Like, we don't. We're good. I've been working on this game since we finished, well, really been thinking about it since we finished The Last of Us. So many people were like, Last of Us 1 is so perfect. It should never have a sequel. They shouldn't make a sequel. They're like, oh, it wrapped up super great. Uh, but I think actually, if you look at the ending, 
Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. Ellie is accepting a lie. I swear. Okay. She has a very good bullshit detector. She knows something doesn't feel right, but I think is too scared at that point to ask. How long can you really live with accepting a lie like that? The Last of Us feels like an origin story for the survivor in this post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> Seeing like how Ellie has become such a strong, unique character, it really felt like, you know, if we were to do a sequel, it'd be a shame for it not to focus on her. Move the fuck out of the way. Sure. I just think like, yeah, it it's an interesting concept to explore Ellie after having processed this lie and everything. But like, I, I, again, I'm just not sure if it adds that much. Cause again, it's really high risk, high reward. If you pull it off, it can work wonders. And like somehow you add it to the story and it's even better than you thought it was going to be. And it adds new layers of complexity to the character. Yeah, that's possible. But you could also screw it up real bad. That's called foreshadowing. Yeah, once we're done with this whole for thing, some. For some. I'm going to teach you how to play guitar. Yeah, I reckon you'd really like that. What do you say, huh? Joel, he's gonna teach Ellie to play a guitar. So that always felt like that's just this like unanswered promise that like was kind of lingering at the end of, of the first game. We did this thing called One Night Live, where we had the actors come on stage and reenact certain scenes. Say, so say we get you to the Fireflies. What happens next? Uh, Marlene, she said that they have their own little quarantine zone, and that doctors are. Still trying to find a cure. I wrote this new scene that takes place after the ending of The Last of Us, but it was only shown to people in the audience. Like, we cut off the stream right before we showed them the scene. If I ever were to lose you, I'd surely lose myself. Try and sometimes you'll succeed to make this man of me. Our future days, days of you and me. She's yours. No, no, no. I don't know the first thing about this. Hey, I promised you I'd teach you how to play. That scene ends with Ellie holding the guitar and playing one note. And that image was so strong in my mind, that I'm sure that kind of trickled into this idea of this trailer. So I started working on some concept art, kept uh, fleshing out the story. And as it felt like it was kind of gaining momentum, Uncharted 4 needed all hands on deck. Apparently Uncharted 4 burned Night out Dog always made so one many game. people. Uh, and as soon as it finishes one game, it works on another. When I started um, on Uncharted 3, we were starting to experiment then with um, trying to do two teams. After we finished Uncharted 3, I jumped onto Uncharted 4. At some point in time, Uncharted 4 was coming down to the wire and it's just, we had to shift resources and pretty much everyone just ended up on Uncharted, trying to finish it up. So I said, okay, before I come on like in full force on Uncharted 4, I just want to capture this trailer. During the entire production of Uncharted 4, that's all I could think about. I had a lot of investment in Uncharted 4, but the day we were done with Uncharted 4, went right back to that trailer to wrap it up. I still remember the first time I saw that trailer. I was like, how on earth did they do this? Do you guys remember it when it dropped? It was, it looked so good. It didn't look like it was possible. It was running in, in reality. Like, it was crazy. It's just crazy. 
like the the fluidity of movement the the like vibration of the guitar strings it was just stunning anything for this shot that's still happening uh not the animation <laughs> Of the shadow of death. This one feels kind of strong to me. Drawing a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Can we tone that down? Yep. I see my biggest fear with this announcement is that it leaks early. More than anything, I have nightmares about this trailer leaking early before we get to PSX. See, the level of attention to detail. Hey, hey this knuckle is a little forced. Can we... What? If we're going to surprise people, PSX, the PlayStation experience, hasn't set itself up yet as a place where big titles get revealed. That's E3. Revealing the Uncharted single-player content at the opening of the show. You're late. That's funny. I thought you were professional. Oh, you should relax. You live longer. No one's going to expect the second Naughty Dog title to be revealed in the same. Uh, Herman Hust. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Cerny? Is that his name? Mike Cerny, I think? He's like the big brains behind all the hardware they do at PlayStation. Um, I don't remember this guy. What's his name? But anyway, the, like these are the, the PlayStation head honchos. These are the guys to look at. And this guy, I it's just his eyes. But I'm pretty sure this is the same guy that was in uh, Raising Kratos, the documentary about the making of God of War 2018. And he's also a PlayStation bigwig that makes a lot of pretty substantial decisions as to what projects get greenlit and canceled and stuff like that. Game press conference. Please welcome to the stage, Sean Layden. Oh, director of... Oh, maybe he is one of the presidents of Naughty Dog. Oh, I think you're right. There's one more, there's one more special on the veil we have for you tonight. Please enjoy it. Oh, Sean. When we first revealed The Last of Us, the Naughty Dog logo came up and the crowd erupted and, and it was such a high that that's almost been like chasing the dragon, like wanting to recapture that feeling. Oh my God. Why does this look like the no. last of us, dude? Yeah. It did look so good. <laughs> Playing it at this surprising moment, I'm hopeful it will have a similar feel. <laughs> People were losing it. What are you doing, kiddo? People outside the studio have such an attachment to the first game, and I've definitely seen fears about not wanting to make a sequel because somehow if it's bad, it will tarnish your feeling about the first game. I'm gonna find, and I'm gonna kill every last one of them. We're doubling down on those fears and not calling it The Last of Us, some subtitle. It's The Last of Us Part Two to say it's all one story. They didn't hate the drama the concept for the sequel had to feel compelling enough um, have enough weight that felt like okay this is an experience worth creating worth spending the next three years on i became really um intrigued with the idea of the cycle of violence and how like certain events would trigger acts of violence that then would beget more acts of violence 
it's almost never satisfying. It never brings the person you love back. And despite you thinking it's gonna bring some closure, it doesn't. We just need more empathy. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could create an experience that lets you safely explore those feelings? With that theme, all of a sudden everything fell into place and this outline emerged. The whole catalyst for what starts the second game is Joel killing the doctor. It feeds right back in that idea of that cycle of violence. Now it sets up this whole kind of sequence of events. We're gonna start the game where you're playing a new character. That sequence ends with this character killing Joel. And we really have to paint her as this monster. Now that's Then when you play the next her. chunk of the game and you're Ellie and you're gonna pursue justice, quote unquote, and you're gonna go kill this entire crew. We're gonna Go back in time and show you that same sequence of events, this character that you saw as a monster, to now get you to see things from her perspective. And how this crew is a bunch of people trying to survive in this world. And they had their reasons for pursuing and finding Joel and killing him. And the story was becoming very epic and ambitious. And, and I had a few parts that I was kind of stuck on and I felt like to kind of shake things up, I wanted to bring in another writer. I thought it was a very thoughtful story about violence and obsession. He had Abby, sort of like this girl who was the daughter of... Dude, that makes me think of like a Pixar version of The Last of Us. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> like, Pixar presents the Last of Us Part Two, with all the gore and everything, that would be kind of crazy. Yeah, it's just it's interesting how I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how they like navigated the initial concept to maybe I'm guessing they probably at times got like cold feet on the concept of what they were doing and maybe tried to walk some of it back, but then double down again. I'm sure there was a lot of tug of war within that, and I'm also wondering if they can show any potential disputes and spats between like members of the studio. Because I would imagine there were people in the studio that didn't love the idea of all of this. I'm, I'm sure there was some infighting. There had to have been, right? Of the doctor. And that Ellie would go on this vengeance quest. And when he was like, and then Ellie actually kills Abby, I was like, what? <laughs> no, you're gonna, yeah, let's fucking do it. Not only is she contributing in a lot of ways, I feel like she's um, challenging what the story can be. She's wanted to add more romantic intimacy between the characters. Those are areas that I've been, I don't know, more uncomfortable writing that stuff. After the first day, she was telling me that she went home and told um, her husband that I think I just got Ellie's girlfriend pregnant because uh, that was her big idea the first day and um, that had this trickle on effect and actually added a lot to the story. I actually think, I don't think we went through this much in the commentary I did on it, but I actually think like the, the pregnancy act, like actively, I don't think it adds much. I don't think it adds much personally. I think if anything, it actively pulls away from it because when like there are some topics that humans just have a guttural reaction to that you can't really help. One of those um, is our natural desire to protect the innocent, to protect the defenseless and the vulnerable. It's something that as, you know, apes, as we evolved swinging in the trees, we um, as a social species benefited from protecting the vulnerable among us. It, it, kept our numbers strong so it's something deep deep within us and i think when you bring in characters that have those traits and are very vulnerable um somebody who's pregnant or an infant there are certain things that people will just never respond well to such as violence against those characters and to me it feels almost cheap as a writer to rely on violence against one of those categories of, of people, you know, a child, a, a baby, a pregnant mother, things like that. 
someone who's disabled or elderly. It feels cheap to rely on that for like shock value. And it seems like that they kind of did that with all of this. Anyway, with all of this, it's just, I think something that is, is probably not actually that constructive. And I think, you know, once they decided Dina was going to be pregnant, they then added Mel as somebody who's pregnant and then they go in and they start tweaking all of this stuff and it just caused more problems because then they're like, oh, well, we have to mirror the two. And so then Ellie ends up killing a pregnant woman and it just gets to the point where you stop sympathizing with the characters because it's just getting more and more horrible. So I actually really dislike this choice that they, they chose to go with. I, and I don't really see how it builds interesting dynamics within the characters to have like Jesse having gotten Dina pregnant, but then because he's gone, it's now up to Ellie to fill that role as the other parent. But then she abandoned, like it just doesn't, I think, add much. It's just more layers of awfulness. Ellie is this very relatable character. I thought she was a perfect vehicle to challenge this notion that violence doesn't have a cost because it does have a cost in reality. It's going to ruin this girl. Oh no! Her you know, people stumps. love Joel and Ellie, and we are about to kill one and make the other one a villain. I was very nervous telling Troy we're gonna kill off Joel. In the first game, he was advocating that Joel should die. When I read the it's all his ending fault. to part one, I was like, you're gonna piss a lot of people off. Let me go. Marlene is the closest thing to a parent that Ellie has had outside of Joel. You just come after her. A lot of people got hurt, and Marlene would be one of those people. But I don't think she's framed as like a motherly figure. I don't, did you guys get that vibe from The Last of Us Part 1? I didn't get that vibe that Marlene was like motherly. I know that they, they kind of imply that she's the one that, you know, protected Ellie, especially after her troubles and after everything with Riley. She made sure she was okay. So... Yeah, and she obviously didn't have Ellie executed when she found out that she had been bitten. But I never got a maternal vibe from her at all. And so I, maybe that's what they were experimenting with, like, in the acting room when they were, like, doing this on the soundstage. But I, I never got that at all. Like, she always seemed to be very... I don't know, if anything, she's... <laughs> She's she almost treats Ellie like an object, you know, it's like she just passes her off to two smugglers that she doesn't know to get her out of the city and take her across the country. Like, is that something you do to somebody you really care about? I don't know if that's what you do. Like she was using Ellie as a pawn. Then she willingly like goes against Ellie's will and doesn't risk even asking her, but has her sedated and then set up to have her brain scooped out basically to create a cure. Like that's not really a, a sympathetic motherly character. I don't find Marlene sympathetic whatsoever, like at all. I was glad when Joel did what he did. Joel has crossed these moral lines and therefore he deserves to die. And he thought he might be a more dramatic ending. And I was like, no, you're crazy. Like, but then in the second game, that's why I was like, thought of like, oh, he would take it pretty easily. He goes, so Joel dies. And he's like, and so this happens. And then, and, and I literally had to stop. I was like, can you give me just a second? Because it literally was as if someone was telling me about how my friend had just died. I think he kind of took it hard. It was like the character meant so much to him. We're gonna kill off this character. His role is gonna be much smaller on, on this one. All of a sudden it was, please don't take this from me yet. Ellie is scared to be alone. Everybody that she's loved up until that point, she's lost them. It's hard to imagine the story without Jill dying. Like, you feel that hate, Ellie feels that hate. You're one to one, you're on the stick, and that informs the rest of the story. This way, come on! You okay? Yeah. We get you through interactivity to really connect and empathize with this character. You look like you heard of us or something. And then make you feel like I've led Joel to a trap.
When we started out making Last of Us Part II, uh, Neil actually wanted to be very ambitious about changing the game almost entirely. In the first like four or five months, the game was actually an, kind of an open world uh, inspired by Bloodborne. What? What? <laughs> and like it was purely melee focused, like it was all hand to hand combat. <laughs> It wasn't just the melee combat, we were also looking at sort of layout structure. Bloodborne had a very, sort of an open space that sort of kept getting bigger and bigger as you explored. I really like that feeling that you get of mastery over the world. I mean, that was something we we thought that they were going to go bigger because in the like Uncharted 4, they had bigger levels. And then with the Lost Legacy, they brought this big, I don't know if you played it, but they brought this like big open central map that had like four of the key objectives in. And you kind of had to complete the four objectives around that big area to unlock the door to move on to the next more linear path. So the whole game was kind of like, you know, a, it starts narrow, gets big and then more narrow again towards the end. And I, so I was like, they're probably building up for bigger levels, but the extent of the big level we got in The Last of Us Part Two was with, of course, Seattle having a pretty big open map there. But that was really underwhelming because it was like a handful of city blocks and you basically go f through these three buildings and then you move on and leave. Like it really was not that expansive. So that, that's fascinating though, but it's not just bigger levels. They were saying they were inspired by Bloodborne. So they wanted to go with like, multiple levels of depth and that's just wow okay it starts to become kind of almost a character in the game itself and so that was also something we were looking at we started out making it as different as humanly possible from the first game as we could uh, and then kind of dialing it back the open world thing didn't work with the story that we were trying to tell and stuff yeah, can you imagine if so in pre-production we spent a lot of time started playing just it, it was like a survival doing game. setups. Self-contained sort of units that tried to expound on a single sort of idea. <laughs> Trying to start out with sort of simple shapes and building up to more complex shapes and starting out with uh, one or two mechanics and building up to those mechanics. Huh? Even our experiments, we try to add like as much context as we can. Like we establish a goal that you're going to be going for. Um, we establish beats so that there's like an emotional journey. The stakes are raised. Figuring out some traversal stuff, a lot of climbing and balance beams and seeing how far we can sort of push in that direction without it getting over the top like Uncharted. More sort of verticality more use of uh, grass and stealth. Uh, my name is Arnaldo Lisa And what do you do here? Uh, I do design. Uh, I know. How long have you been doing that? <laughs> A day. <laughs> I got an opportunity to work in QA, and that was um, that was a great learning experience. Uh, I shipped The Last of Us and Uncharted 4. The thing I'm proudest of is the people who came in to a quality assurance job as a contractor, which is entry-level work, and uh, used that job to get to where they ultimately wanted to be. When I interviewed for the QA position, I specifically said that my goal was to be a designer. He had formed this relationship with design where they knew they could rely on him, spending his free time designing a demo, and at the same time, him going to them and not being like, here's 50 bugs you need to fix. He went to them and was like, what do you need? How do I help you? What kind of bugs do you need? And for their part, they embraced him and were like, why don't we show you how to lay out nav mesh? I am anxious. Holy Perrier, dude. This guy is a sparkling water connoisseur, Jesus Christ. <laughs>
<laughs> like, whoa. That's crazy. To, to prove myself, there is no babying when you start. It's, it just hits the ground running. If I don't cut it, I go back to QA or find something else. We're trying to figure out at the moment uh, how we handle big spaces, uh, bigger than the first game. The enemies are so, like too spread out to be really considered no, like Dina, one single no. small encounter. Um, and seeing what behaviors we need to start developing for them to make it look good. I just, I always think like with leaks and stuff, imagine if this leaked and it was like, oh, a sneak peek at the next Naughty Dog game. Check it out. It's too spread out to be <laughs> really just considered see this. like one single small encounter. Like people lose um, their minds. Seeing what behaviors we need to start developing for them to make it look good. Last of Us for the Switch, basically. Too. The opening of Seattle, that whole section was pretty slow and quite linear in the level design. Let's assume that there's guys in this building, someone's starting to shoot at me from the second floor. So, okay, if I'm on the horse and I'm getting shot at, I can't take cover with the horse, so I'm probably first thing I'm gonna do is jump off. And that's slow, slow and clumsy, and maybe we can make that faster. It's like, but once I jump off, I'm gonna wanna take cover behind something. It's like, okay, I'm taking cover. Now what the fuck do I do with this horse? Um, it's, I assume the enemies are gonna shoot at it. If they don't, that's kind of weird. Uh, does Dina ride off with the horse to help it uh, stay safe? Well, that sucks, because I'm trying to build a relationship with Dina, and if my partner leaves me, that makes me like her less. I'm like, okay, so D Dina has to get off the horse and take cover with me and help me engage with the enemies. Okay, but the horse is still there, so what happens with this horse? Does it ride off on its own in order to like protect itself and then come back after? Oh, that feels too intelligent for a horse. That seems a little funny. As soon as there's range combat, the horse kind of makes it fall apart. What if I we did this whole sequence on foot? How do I approach this building? Imagine this is more dense with cars and ferns and interesting ways for me to close this distance. Maybe when I get close enough, uh, two militia guys come out. I have this little firefight um, with this front before I could rush forward and go into this building, climb up and take out the sharpshooter that was harassing me. Really simple, small fight. Now there's tension. Guys can come from anywhere, like from this rooftop, from these windows. And that it's, it's very important to think of it like this. Like this is why I think these videos are so cool seeing the background of how they design encounters and all the thought that goes into it. Like something as simple as there's this encounter in this building, but if you're on a horse, there's all these cascading effects of things that don't really make sense. And now people are going to get disconnected from their companions. And there's all these different layers of things that follow from just being on a horse, but being on foot, all of a sudden it makes more sense. And the combat encounter works better. And then the companions can actually help you. And there's not this weird obligation to go and track down your horse after it runs off. You know, there's a lot of cool things that can follow from it, but this is why it's not as simple as like, you know, oh, just uh, you ride your horse through here, combat, whatever. Like these little things that you have to think through um, are very, very important. And a lot of people just never even consider it. That really inspired us to take some pretty drastic changes as far as the flow, inserting more combat, opening up the layout to give the player more options as far as how they explore the city. You can imagine this as being kind of the hub with it poking into streets and I could go into the streets and explore and find those locations, what we're kind of calling dungeons. So that's the plan. Uh, some of these changes are big, but it got us excited. This feels like a true evolution of T1 as far as going more systemic and giving you options. If there's concern, it's about scale, it's about scope, it's about can we actually build this thing? The scope is always bigger than the last game. It always has been. It always will be, probably. Uh, but this scope on this game is, is something pretty extraordinary. Everyone seems to agree that the thing we're building is going to be cool. Once it's done, it's just that it's such a big, such a big game. Our games have become more and more ambitious, and uh, the studio has gotten a lot bigger. When I started here, we were 40 people. Now we're over 300. You can't handle that many people with a flat hierarchy. As we grew, we've had to introduce new titles just to control management, control communication, make sure things don't fall through the cracks. 
We have no producers at Naughty Dog. There's so many talented people here that you can rely on and lean on. It makes the game better. And that's really kind of the secret sauce of Naughty Dog is how collaborative it is. You find the right people who really and I also think that there's something to be said for like the physical space. There was something, I read an article years and years ago. It was probably honestly in college, but it was on, um, you can tell a lot of, it was like called like, you can tell a lot about a company from the workspace. And the idea of the article was basically just that when you look at a, a physical workspace, you can tell a lot about not just the individual in that, like say individual cubicle, but if you look at the office in general, you can get a vibe of what's important. So if you had a bunch of individual offices, it's probably a very private institution. They prioritize um, focus, privacy. They care about like the, the sound levels. They want it to be quiet, people to be able to do their own thing in their own bubble. But even with cubicles, like when I worked in real estate, we had cubicles kind of like this, but ours were even higher. So ours went up like maybe to, to here from this wall, like all the way up. So you could stand up and like it was, you're probably covered. And that was because like they wanted us to have privacy, but also for it to be able to be a little more collaborative. So if I needed to get up and go talk to a coworker, I could do that, get up, go over to like this cubicle or this cubicle and chat with them about whatever I was working on. And so like just from that, you could tell a difference. And with this, what this would suggest to me is that they are trying to go with a really collaborative thing. You can see a lot of personal decorations and things where uh, <laughs> it's funny, this guy, has just a ton of crap everywhere. <laughs> Tons of books and artwork, a Mr. Incredible statue and planets and an egg for some reason. But then he also has like boxes and like backpacks and jackets and stuff and trash. It's just funny. So he's got his whole thing and then a bunch of little, I think Pokemon maybe, I don't know, lining the monitors uh, behind my, my face um, back here. But then like you can just tell that this is meant to be a big open space where everybody's working together and where they want to encourage you. If you want to get up from your desk here and go talk to this guy or this guy, it's going to take you five seconds to walk over there and have that conversation to work on something. And they'll group these together probably. So like this is the level design team. So they're all close to each other. And maybe the programmers, there's some programmers back in the back corner. So if you gotta go talk to them about something, you can get up and go over there. It's it's very, yeah, like somebody said in chat, it's almost like environmental storytelling. You can tell a lot about the discourse or, or the, the uh, priorities within a studio just from how it's laid out. And I think that this shows just that, that it's a very, uh, it's a space very much about collaboration and working together directly, having those open conversations, a very flat hierarchy um, of how they want individuals to work. It's not about, a, you know, 120 or like 200 workers or 300 workers underneath a few managers that are in their offices in the back corners that don't talk to anybody. It's about all kind of working together, which I think is it's cool. You find the right people who really want to do the best they can possibly do, and then you kind of give them the resources to try. You're getting what you asked for as a creative person, right? You're, like, you're kind of getting the freedom to go as far as you can go, but sometimes I think we need to be saved from ourselves a little bit. With uh, The Last of Us 2, there's a real sense of opportunity. This is going to be uh, a much cleaner production than we've done in the past. We're going to get it right this time. This is the first project. That's foreshadowing uh, because it didn't go very smoothly. What is this? Design schedule. Schedule. So what is it? These are dates. This was June 28th, 2019, it looks like. So they have each employee in the column. It's like Asher. Asher has Ski Escape LL, I think. And then further down, I guess that means that Asher's working on that. I think that's August 23rd. So probably for two months working on that and then moves over to SLE Sniper Beta, I think. So uh, maybe Seattle, Seattle environment, something like that. I don't know, something like, I, I don't know what that would be. But with this, uh, it works on that. And then this one works for that on a couple of weeks and then moves on on vacation for five weeks or four weeks, five weeks, whatever it is. Um, Cause I think it's, yeah, it's per week. So then you have, you know, all of this broken down where each person is working on these different things at any given time. Looks like the Suicide Squad UI. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> 
Jesus. That game can't catch a break. He'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> Jesus. So yeah, like this is what goes into these games. Uh, it's it's a lot of very careful management. That has had the proper pre-production period where we have locked down, for the most part, the story beginning, middle, and end before we started production. That hasn't happened. I don't know if that has ever happened, <laughs> that I think about it. It's a very, very messy process, which is, again, why it's a lot of times really difficult to schedule. I think right now we are planning on springtime of 2018. So when springtime 2018 comes around, The Last of Us 2 isn't in stores, um, you can look back at this and say, uh, well, I guess they their plan wasn't exactly set in stone. Remember I said that was foreshadowing? <laughs> Oops! Oops! Oh, are they gonna diss Historically, managers? we've done very poorly at um, being efficient uh, without the pressure of an external deadline. Every time we have some showing of our games, if it's gonna be seen publicly, it's gotta be one of the best looking, playing things in the industry. For example, the first trailer was coming online and that forced us to define the look of our game, define the location of where the game takes place, define Ellie's look and her age and her hair and her outfit. We're f What's always crazy to me though is that these first reveal trailers, like they didn't have a game at this point. This was like one of the very first things they did that they then based everything else off of. So often like you see a trailer like this and you're like, ooh, there have to be so many hints at the rest of the game in, in the room. I remember looking at this. Do you guys remember this? Like seeing this trailer and then looking over here and the poster says Theseus. And so everybody's like, oh, that's clearly, clearly a hint at the story, right? That's gotta be a hint at the story. There's no way that that would just be there for no reason at all, right? I remember like going so deep on this. So like Theseus, it's like the, the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. So if we look at that, then it's like, okay, what's this story about? What, what is this story about? Uh, the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. Um, uh, so the queen slept with a bull. So maybe you sleep with a big hairy man and then you gave birth to a minotaur. So like an ugly baby and it's a half man, half bull. So it's like a, a baby that's hung. And then a king Minos was embarrassed, but did not want to kill the minotaur. So he hid the monster in a labyrinth. So he sent it to like a permanent daycare. And then I go. And so you start to like to read into all this insane stuff to try to figure out what the hell is going on. And a lot of time, funnily enough, there isn't actually much going on. It's just a thing they put up, <laughs> you know, that's it. That's it. That's all there is. Forced to make those choices. We can't just keep iterating because there's a deadline. We want to try and schedule the game using these milestones as soon as possible. Which means we got to keep the marketing rolling, which means next E3, six months away, we need to look at a gameplay demo. E3, it's always been the biggest and most extravagant showing of the game industry. There's something special about the energy of E3. We need to figure out what the gameplay is, because right now it's just we've got a bunch of like cool prototypes and stuff like that, so it's scary. But we work well under pressure. We were hoping to be really aggressive and show at E3 2017 just to really kick the project into gear as fast as humanly possible. Started in January. We want to break it up into a roughly two minute cinematic, a flashback sequence that will set kind of emotional context for what will then go into a five minute uh, gameplay sequence. We want to do this um, festival within Jackson. Like there'll be like a live band and we're just seeing people lively having fun. And for the crowd, are you thinking 30 plus people? Frank says we could do a 30 variation. I think we can make that work with 30. Yeah. Uh, Dina pulls Ellie onto the dance floor. Ellie's dancing with her, he's making all these guys jealous. And then Dina says, you want to make them really jealous? And she leans over and kisses her. And on that, we do a hard cut to Ellie in the middle of the woods. Um, so the idea is we shouldn't see any buildings, just woods, water, ankle deep water rushing underneath <coughs> her. What about uh, rain? Are we still going rain? Uh, I haven't discussed it with the other guys, but... That demo that we show externally for the very first time is setting the bar for the rest of development. But the problem is we're also working on Charted 4 Lost Legacy. 
So E3 is June 13th, which means probably we want to be done, what, like two weeks before that, which is four and a half months from now. <clears throat> With Lost Legacy shipping at around the same time of E3, uh, there are shared resources between the two projects. Especially sound and particle effects, so they were all on Uncharted. And when we come to the polish phase, both we're polishing this and that same, and SPD yeah. at the same time. I don't, I, I don't think there's any specific item that needs to be worked on, but I think it's, there's going <laughs> to be programmer time doing both those things. And there are going to be times when we're, it's like this needs polishing in E3 and this needs polishing in SPDLC, and like, we're going to have to compromise the times, maybe. We kind of just didn't have it at the forefront of our minds that, yeah, they're freaking shipping a video game. It's literally the hardest part of making the game is shipping it. And we were trying to ship a demo, the second hardest thing you can do, at the same time and sharing a lot of their resources. Uh, so one thing... I also kind of love this. They have <laughs> on the columns, they put, like, the white laminate stuff so that you can use it as a whiteboard. I just kind of love that. Isn't that great? Makes sense. Why have a big whiteboard to like draw out ideas when you can just do this? Isn't that cool? Uh, Fresh Killer, thank you for the five. Wait, half bull, half man, but Ellie is human and infected. You're not far off, LMAO. Maybe put there intentionally. Yeah, I, who knows? Who knows? Maybe they'll talk about it. I don't know. But it did feel like too, too on the nose to like not be intentional because it's like in big bold letters. This is like, surely it's there um to tell us something and maybe maybe at the time it was trying to tell us something who knows but uh yeah it's funny I, I remember all those little bitty details now even if it was there to tell us something it could have changed by the time we got the game you know it would be helpful is to find out what are the items that you feel like you're most worried about like let's say rain we could do this thing without rain so if that helps you a ton we can make the decision now to remove rain it would definitely help oh wait here well she's going swimming then we can get around that right Hold on, no swimming. Yeah, Google the lyrics. <laughs> I got like a really clear energy of the meeting, which was uh, how do we shrink it? It was such an impossible task. You can't help but start feeling some doubt, some anxiety about the leadership, not understanding the logic of it. Uh, you know, I think like anybody else here, I was definitely ready to roll up my sleeves and figure it out. Uh, we're gonna try to keep this pretty short. The uh, next day. You know, I guess. Um, so after last yesterday's meeting, there were a lot of side conversations, and there was sort of a sentiment about um, how much work there was to get not only this demo done to ship Lost Legacy, and it matched up with feelings that we were having. So we started discussing the responsibility of actually attempting this and started to feel that it was a little bit irresponsible um, that if we were to try to meet both these deadlines we could probably do it but we would end up doing a lesser job on both projects both deadlines than um, we would if we were doing them individually and feels like they're both important enough to give them the due attention so the conclusion that definitely is there is that the demo that was discussed yesterday will not send it to E3. Um, yeah. Does it mean that our main point should be just focusing on more shipping before? The last thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely, but I mean, uh, we should still try to we don't like I said just want to just completely halt work on this and you know all hands on deck on on yeah. Lost Legacy. Um, the idea is still to finish the demo just to give us a buffer so that these two deadlines aren't overlapping. Okay. It's just now we have more time to work on this demo properly yeah. without the pressure. Once that meeting happened, it was just like right, of course, I'm not in the twilight zone. Um, it makes sense not to do this. It felt really nice seeing the leadership kind of have, having the teams back and seeing the logic of the situation in front of them. What a novel concept. I was like, good for them though. Literally the next day, walking it back and just being like, never mind. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Never mind. Is it? Cool. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. okay, so are you pissed off? Am I pissed off? Uh, no. Uh, what am I? Uh, I guess in on one sense it's relieved because yeah. we 
there was concern of whether we could hit the quality that we know we need to hit for both Lost Legacies and for our what was going to be our E3 demo. And then on the other hand, it's kind of disappointed because I was excited to get this demo done and get it out there and get the reaction, but now it's going to have to happen at some other point. What we've decided to do is deliver the demo at around the same time, um, but that's going to be purely internal and the demo won't be 100% shippable. Gameplay and design and animation are going to be locked in June. Then, like, we back off, we finish Lost Legacy, and then resources free up to finish the particle effects, the lighting, and the sound. And then we ship just the glossiest, best-looking demo you've ever seen. We burn that to a disc at the beginning of January, and then we don't touch it again, and nobody sees it until E3. It's going to be really interesting to see if we can really, really commit to being done you know, five months, six months in advance of E3 and not be tempted to say like, eh, it could be a little better, let's go back. I have a feeling this whole thing is just a tale of perfectionists not knowing when to stop. And uh, it, it reminds me of um, Six Days to Air, which was the documentary that was done on the studios that make South Park. And Matt Stone and Trey Parker, they had a really interesting thing that they said, and they basically said, we just don't have time to have writer's block and to be perfectionists. Like we have six days from when, we, like from when we start on the episode to when it airs. So we have to get it done. There, There is no other option. And that's why like some studios that are full of perfectionists seem to thrive on crunch because like it gives them a deadline and they have to figure it out by that date. And then they have to stop working on it. Um, but then they suffer because they're going through crunch in order to make it happen, you know? And we, we really just need to have the discipline not to do that. Um, but that then left us as like, okay, what's our next marketing beat? What, else, what are we gonna show next from this game? So now we have a new plan where we're going to release a cinematic um, around PSX time. I think we're going to do it at the Paris Game Show. This seemed like a pretty intriguing scene to introduce Abby that whole scene is going to be our next marketing beat. And then we're not going to say much about it, about how this fits into the game, where it fits into the game. Everybody thought this was Ellie's mom. Abby evolved over time. And you, if you look at the concept art, like the character looked very different than where we've ended up. Why did they change it? I don't remember at what point we decided to go with someone like really kind of muscular and broad. But I remember once the idea came up, it felt very fresh. Once we sort of nailed down the body of Abby, we played around with different ideas of how we wanted to accentuate her arms or not. And there's something interesting in Abby feeling a lot like Joel. So when I got cast, Neil was like joking around. He's like, you should probably beef up in order to play her. And I'm like, ha ha ha, yeah, it's mocap, whatever. And he goes, no, really, you should probably beef up to play her. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I should totally start deadlifting as much as possible. So I did, and I was training like crazy. And then I got pregnant. Eh, what are you going to do? We need to Oops. separate her from Ellie. It shouldn't feel like I'm playing a reskinned Ellie, that Abby should in many ways look, behave, fight, differently. So in gameplay, we've discussed, well, she needs to have different upgrade trees. It means we have to make the investment of capturing a whole different moveset for Abby. We can't just remap Ellie's animation onto Abby. Holy fuck. Abby has a fear of height, and there's stuff we're doing with the camera to make you feel vertigo. Uh, and that helps build empathy. It makes this character real. We let you both live. And you wasted it. She's aesthetically a very intriguing and iconic and powerful character. Abby, who are these kids? They saved my life. Can you take a look at her? Once she's killed Joel, her what is Abby's motivation? What is she trying to achieve? Her redemption has really taken care of Yara and Lev, these two kids that are from a warring faction. 
you know, she has been taught to hate them. There is an inherent xenophobic uh, reaction to them. It's about saying, can you come to love your enemy? Scars built all this? Seraphites. Yeah, I was gonna say that. These are kids that grew up in a very different context as Ellie and, you know, how they live their lives and experience the world is totally different. Got your present. I'm getting really attached to Lev. He's been able to keep his head up despite losing so much himself in a world that is so harsh. We're taking too long. <laughs> Can't move any faster. I won't do your sister any good if we're both dead. I really like his dynamic with Abby. Well, maybe it will her do Her having this, more. like, fucking brassy little sidekick who, who calls her on her shit in a way that nobody else can. What's going on between you and your friend Owen? Oh my god, Lev, now? It seemed really awkward. Just go! That was funny. Who understands the sort of sense of being orphaned in the way that um, a lot of people can't. How long have you two been on the run for? Two days. What is this? Yeah, this is the apartment. So this is the apartment in the game that has like a whole D and D thing set up. It's really cool. What the hell did you? I don't know if they'll they do. show the angle. I shaved my head. But like they have a bunch of stuff set up in it where like they have board games everywhere. So like Two days. I always wondered if this was like uh, one of the gameplay designers apartment that they just modeled in the game because they have a lot of little gamey things. And it was like so they were playing. They had people over and they were playing Dungeons and Dragons when the outbreak happened and so everything is still laying around yeah maybe it's just a critical role easter egg or something i don't know but i thought it was a really cool touch it was it was fun and i i still remember that apartment to this day like I, it's it's very burnt in my in my brain what did you do i shaved my head they want to kill a little boy because he shaved his head i am not trans so it's a very delicate thing to tell a story of an experience that I have not had. Um, and that's something that we want to take seriously. Did you hear what they called me? Yeah. Do you want to ask me about it? Do you want me to ask you about it? No. OK. It's really about trying to create a multifaceted character who is trans, and that is uh, absolutely an important part of who he is, but also a part of who he is not the whole of who he is. As far as the Paris cutscene, I'm pretty stressed out. We have 13 days, less Dude, than two. That looked like Pedro Pascal. I thought that was Pedro for a second. Come on, that looks like Pedro. Come on. We have 13 days. Who knew? Less than two weeks to finish this thing, and there are still some big ticket items. Lost Legacy turned out to be a much bigger project than we originally envisioned, but now that it's done, everyone is now on board. We've got the green light demo done. She's a. Uh but not quite the show. Oh, that's interesting. Je they used a, a generic NPC for Jesse and then the same one to dance with Dina. <laughs> it's kind of the, the dead eyes, the Starfield eyes really sell it. Real, we're in full production now. So I guess that's the short of it is we're in full production now. Hey everybody, PlayStation's live at Paris Games Week 2017. We've got a huge show for you starting now. Wow, what a great way to open Paris Games Week. Let's have the first in-depth look at a much anticipated and exclusive title. Last of Us 2, Last of Us 2. Please, please, please be Last of Us 2. Our fans, they want to know every last thing about what's going to be in this game. Is this, is this The Last of Us? Neil has taken the way, you know, he kind of creates an arc or like this sense of drama, this kind of sense of mystery or like dramatic tension and crazily has brought it to marketing. I view marketing as part of the game. It's very calculated what we put out there and how we want you to connect different marketing assets. When we first released the teaser trailer, too many people right off the bat said Joel is dead. 
the blown out light really, it really fucked us in a way I don't think any of us are coming. <laughs> it was a little heavy handed. The white backlight as he walks in, everybody's like, oh, he's dead. He's dead for sure. <laughs> actually underestimated our audience a little bit. They're so sophisticated now. So you have to get more sophisticated, like how am I still gonna surprise players and viewers? You start on characters you've never seen before in a world that like could be The Last of Us, could be anything. That creates like a really, really cool sense of tension. At no point are we gonna market that you play as this other character. What is this? God, it looks good though. I was so excited about working on it and I couldn't say anything. It was so rough. Oh, is she gonna cut a baby out of her belly? And That's why everyone thought it was Ellie's mom. Book that shows Ellie's mom pregnant. So people already had theories that Last of Us Part Two was gonna have Ellie's mom. Oh, if we just kind of black out the letters, she has the same number of letters as Anna, Ellie's mom's name, we'll get people to think this is Ellie's mom. Oh my God. Girl's got a good... That hammer's from the Outbreak poster. So we had that poster with the forearm of a character you've never seen before, with this like kind of wolf's head in the background. What does that mean? You know, kind of like prompting this mystery. You want people to feel like they Wolf, the WLF, Abby. Uh, uh. Now, if she had been holding a golf club, that would have been, that would have been some next level trolling. Put everything out and then have the story surprise them Somebody Man, saying this God is the last of, of us too, bro. I'm gonna go crazy. Oh my God. Oh my God. Last of us too. Last of us too? Yes! 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 Bitch! Yes! I fucking knew it! Everything that we put out there is shaping expectation. And then the final game, hopefully, if we do our job right, should subvert those expectations in an interesting way. October 30th, 2017. Oh, yeah, we were don't even pushing know. boundaries with that cinematic. We are making a violent game. We're not going to shy away from how violent it is. It is part of what we're trying to say. And I thought it was a great discussion initially about what is the appropriate level of violence? When is something so violent that it just turns you off where you just don't want to experience it at all? I like that they were wrestling with those things. I didn't like some of the insinuations about the trailer being misogynistic. Uh, towards the female characters. I don't think this story ever glorifies violence against women. There's no bias towards women or men. It just so happens that the two protagonists of this story are female, and therefore that's what you're gonna see the most of. There has to be fail states in video games, which means a character has to be capable of being hurt. So does that mean that there can be no female protagonists in video games? Not just female protagonist. I think they're saying specifically like this was a, a trailer, not saying that any of these were protagonists, but it's like the female bad guy that's trying to cut you open that gets a hammer jammed in her face. And then of course, Abby that gets hung, cut and like, like beaten up and dropped and dragged. And then there's uh, Yara who gets her wings clipped and gets cut and like her, her arm gets crushed by a hammer. So in like one series of, of cinematics, you have at the very least three women that are getting brutally injured. Some in one case, more uh, mortally wounded. So I, I think you could say that like maybe the, the dedication to having mostly like female characters in the trailer that is extremely violent makes it seem like you're doing that. But I, I agree, like the argument's a little flimsy because it's like, what about all the trailers for games where it's male characters getting brutally murdered? We never say that it's like, oh, you hate men now. Nobody's saying that. It's just, you know, if you want to be upset about something, you can find reasons to be upset about it. Um, because that feels super sexist to me. And frankly, like women are the victims of violence and don't we want to see women fucking fight back once in a while? Oh, I forgot. Character. The two guys also get caught, so. Her hand getting hurt it has consequences for hours of gameplay to come. One article even, like, asked the question, were any women involved in the making of this? And it's like, 
Yeah, the co-writer, the lead character designer, the lead character artist, all the actresses that worked on, on that scene. This is a, it says a lot, though, I think, that Neil is reading these articles. Because if I were him, if I saw an article like that, I'd be like, okay, this is like bad faith, stupid BS. And I wouldn't like bother reading it. It's like, okay, they're not arguing like good faith. They're, they're like being super toxic, but still. I... That's so fucking... Here's what I hate about that article. I'm sorry. Do a modicum of fucking research. Just a, just a modicum. Just a modicum of research. Just like a little bit before you put something out there to suggest that no woman could have worked on this because of the level of violence, because there was violence against women, because it is a video game is so fucking sexist. I mean, I just think it's stupid. <laughs> I don't think you have to go any further than that. It's just a dumb rage bait article that's meant to like rile up a, a community of people that will be pissed about anything that makes them moderately uncomfortable. So like, I agree it's stupid and you shouldn't take it seriously. I, I don't know if it's necessarily they're, they're like dismissing, like they're saying women couldn't work on something violent because that's against their sensibilities. Maybe they're saying that and I agree that's, that's, sexist and stupid but i think it's just a dumb article written by somebody who's stupid i think that's all it is really at the end of the day <laughs> like they shouldn't read it why are I they so like concerned watching graphic violence does that make me less female like i like having a conversation about what power is does that make me less fucking female i like working at a video game i like playing video games does that make me less fucking female like suck a dick don't put it that in i can't while calling them sexist and then you say suck a dick. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, she did the thing. That's funny. I will say, like, they've spent five minutes talking about this stupid article that, like, I remember seeing a headline about it and making fun of it and then moving on. And, like, I forgot about it until now. And I think that's how you generally have to do it. People ask me, they're like, oh, Luke, did you see the people on the Suicide Squad Reddit were talking about your video? They're very upset with you. I'm like, no, I didn't read it because I don't, like, I don't care. I say what I think and you can take it or leave it if it upsets you. Cool. If you agree, cool. I don't care. I just do what I'm going to do. Like, I don't care. You can love it or hate it. I'm going to keep doing my thing. And as long as I'm doing my thing, it seems like generally people like like to hear what I have to say for whatever reason. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Screw them if they are upset by it. I don't know why somebody let's say in the like industry leading position is so concerned with a single article written by a moron. I can't. Neil's going to say put it in, but don't. Um, I also don't represent all women, but I represent like I can represent this and say I fucking wrote this. I wrote this like I literally wrote the sentence and then Yara eviscerates his, 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 eviscerates his esophagus from his throat. I wrote that sentence that is in the script and I fucking stand by it. <sighs> I'm afraid of being turned into a token rather than the truth, which is like, we're being thoughtful about the female narrative. These characters are more than just their vaginas. If you want to have a serious debate about feminism and feminism in video games and female depiction uh, of violence, and you need to not see it as a binary conversation. It is an incredibly nuanced conversation. You cannot make blatant statements, and you cannot make presumptions. Fucking do your homework. It's funny, though, because I think that Neil and Haley are the types to, like, be upset by that article. And yet they are very concerned with catering to the people that wrote that article uh, or the types of people that write those articles. And I think it says a lot that they're so frustrated by people in their own circle, you know. I'm right here. I'm tweeting. <laughs> the tone of the violence in the game has always been important to portray as realistically as possible. 
Our job outside Jesus. of just drawing up concepts is really pushing our reference pipeline um, to make sure that the character artists are getting the most realistic examples of whatever they're working on. We can't find certain things, so we make the reference ourselves. Simulating brain on wall. One, two, three. How does that drip fall down? What does canvas look like when it's soaked in blood? Yeah, this is, I remember seeing a documentary years ago. I think it was on the making of Fallout 3 because they created the system for like dynamic gore. And there was one guy in the studio who had to look up videos and pictures of like horrible car accidents and shootings and like the most horrible things you can imagine looking up. He had to look all that up because he designed the gore system. So he had to make it look like what it would look like. And he had to do all that research. So when he was doing his research, he had to put up like a little sign that said, don't look at Mike's computer or whatever. Looks like me after eating Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's Taco Bell. Uh, but like, this is one of those things you don't really think about the person who has to do this, like that has to do this, this research, you know, it's crazy. Ooh. <laughs> Splashing blood on them, dripping blood on them. Nice. We put down some wet mud pooled blood onto it to see how blood would react to a wet dirt surface. So there's like little pieces of uh, grass and like twigs. And I would love to see the like, like there's actually movement. them take these bills for this stuff to the accountant. The you spent how much money on cow blood got and dirt? Why? And we stuck it in Yara's shirt sleeve and hit it with a hammer. Here we go. Yeah, we have a break. She's gonna need to hold this as straight, because if she does this, it's gonna, you know, just the weight of it's gonna want to make it fold. They call that praying mantis arms. Nikki worked at a trampoline park, and she showed me videos of injuries that happened on her watch that, like, kids would be playing on the trampolines and jump and land, like, on their forearms like trying to catch themselves and then their forearms would snap like halfway right there and just go full praying mantis arms so they just gain another elbow yeah you can't unsee those videos it's like uh, <laughs> it's pretty horrible pretty horrible the kids were all okay you know after they got to the hospital but still jesus jesus well so I'm trying to keep it as straight as possible this past week's shoot was specific for the infected eating uh, people's jugulars. And there was a concept that was done with like blood running down the mouth, but it's like, would that happen? Like, let's find out. Uh, I got on the ground and pretended to eat away at like a bloody soaked rag that we made. <laughs> Can you just imagine, honey, how is work today? Well, uh... Why is your face stained? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it produced some pretty surprising results because like most of my face got covered in blood. Look up a little, John, but yeah. Teeth. People here will go to that length of trying to make sure that things feel as real as possible. Yeah, we do a lot of crazy stuff here. Nobody gets hurt, but... <laughs> it's really hard to see these characters that you spend so much time with and, for lack of a better word, kind of like, you know, birthing into existence, tortured and abused. We have time, yeah, we have time. Let's hear them discuss this. Buckle up. And then at the end of this, we'll break the segment and we'll do a second segment, part two of reacting to The Last of Us, part two, making of part two, grounded. We're shooting the Joel death scene, which is like the catalyst of opening of the game. The scene has all of Abby's crew. It's a complicated scene because it's the most active we've ever had. 
in a single shot. You all act like you hurt us or something. Because they have. Or, or, Joel doesn't die. <laughs> <laughs> just, just make sure you that now. Now that you got that. Well, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The minor line So change. then what happens <laughs> is yeah, yeah. all of us become friends. Yeah. Knowing what was going to happen and knowing how it was going to happen, I got very fearful. There's so much weight to this scene. This scene has to be right. It's really difficult to reshoot it if we need to. But in the first game, having to call Troy and Hannah back to reshoot Sarah's death was very, very, very difficult for me. The last time I tried to do a big emotional scene. Don't do this. Please don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Please, God, no. Oh, God. I always felt so bad because he's just sitting there and like they originally directed it. So he had to lean in and like touch Joel's shoulder and they cut that because it was really awkward. He's just sorry, your daughter just died. I'm sorry. It was really, really awkward. So this this whole scene was just really the camera cuts into him and, and Joel and, and so it kind of pivots away. So you kind of forget that Tommy's there. But yeah, it's just it, it goes to show you. Something as simple as a camera angle. This camera angle is really freaking awkward. It was used to like give animators reference and stuff, but they ended up changing it so that he was in the background so you didn't see him because otherwise it just was was too awkward. But something as simple as a camera angle can take a scene from being super intense to distractingly awkward. Oh no! <laughs> that didn't go too well. And we had to reshoot it. Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Come on. <laughs> how the hell am I going to play this? Like, how are we going to do this? I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have the, the chops. Am I going to put Laura through this? Because I know how hard it's going to be on her. Audio. Camera. Rolling. Take one, Mark. Action. <laughs> <laughs> Joel Miller. Who are you? Guess. Why don't you just get out of whatever speech you rehearsed? Get this over with. You don't get to rush this. Dan, I really loved what he brought to it. I couldn't wait to get back into Ellie's shoes again because it's where, weirdly, I feel most comfortable in a lot of ways because it feels like a, a character that feels the most like me that I've ever played, which is a little disturbing. I mean, minus like the murder and the killing. So it's almost like a bit of step forward, like you're oh, about you're to like, lunge right? and shoot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. The biggest change that has happened since the initial pitch is Ellie is there when Joel is killed. It used to be she came across the body, and then she had to rely on Tommy's testimony of what happened, and we shifted it, which made it much more dramatic and intense for her, uh, and I think puts more of it on screen and again, allows you better to understand why she needs to pursue these people. <laughs> <laughs> The hardest part for me was. I think it's, I mean, Abby being, or Abby, Ellie being there to witness his death, like the killing blow, was a little contrived because, of course, the timelines work out perfectly. So, right as she's about to finish killing him, that's when Ellie shows up. And I know you could say that Abby decided to finish it and be done with all of this once Ellie showed up and she's like, okay, we have to finish this. Boom. But little bit contrived, a little forced, and then specifically also to like pin her down and make her watch also felt oddly cruel, especially if you're trying to, yeah, Owen says to finish it. Um, that's fair. That's true. So I guess, you know, she would have, she could have kept going, but I don't know. It just always felt a little off to me that you're going to try to make me feel bad for Abby 
and her crew when they like they didn't necessarily know who Ellie was but it's still like a stranger who knows Joel clearly she's screaming Joel and then they're gonna make her watch you know it's just kind of weird it's just kind of weird they never sat right with over it Ashley no no knowing that that Troy was gonna not be a part of it as much was really hard and knowing that Joel was not going to be in Ellie's life anymore. It was just, it was hard. So much of that day kind of feels like a blur because there were so many feelings involved in it. What I had to do, I felt was very, very little. There's one reaction and beyond that, we're on Ashley. There was no acting. There was pure, raw emotion. I'm staring in the face of that. Joel! <laughs> Why are you doing this? Get the fuck off me! I'd lost a little bit of my voice. I couldn't scream like as loud as I wanted to, you know, to get that frustration and that sadness out. Ashley was behind crying and God. And knowing Abby was taking this away from her was very difficult. Um, and so I was crying when we were filming that scene. Yes, it was very emotional. You want what I want, right? End it. Now. Wait, please stop! No! No! Joel! Joel! No! <laughs> we want him to die in this really unforgiving sort of way. Like, it needs to feel senseless for you to say, fuck these people, I'm going to pursue them to the ends of the earth and make them pay. If the scene doesn't work with what we captured on the stage, almost nothing we do in post is going to make it work. Joe will take a pass at the scene. And I'll give kind of high-level notes. But he's doing it without animated cameras, without character models, without environment. And so it's a bit of a guessing game to see if this will work. So I like the concept. I felt like there was a lot of repetition, and it felt long. Okay. Once, like, Joel's head gets smashed, I don't want a close-up look of him. Okay. I you know, what if we could do, like, the smash from the back of his head? Yeah, I'd want so it. just, yeah. like, you, it'd right. be, like, a black shape, and you see, like, a silhouette change, and, like, blood starts pouring out, but I don't focus on it. Like, I don't see the details. Mm -hmm. When the club comes down, and it's just, like, she's screaming, mm. I feel like we could just take all their audio out, and, like, music could take over. And again, we're trying to build more rage than sadness. That's going to really set up our journey. Okay. I'll come back and there'll be another version of the scene. Okay, play. Joel, fucking get up. Please stop. Please stop this dude. Joel, please stop. No! 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 Overall, it's fucking awesome. Like, I. I got emotional just the part where before he gets killed, it feels so fucking tense. There certainly is still a ton to do. We still have like 45 scenes that haven't even been looked at yet. It's terrifying given our deadline. Um, the process right now is just getting Neil. We just need, need to get Neil into the room. Which one are we showing first? We've got essentially three versions. The one that I did, and this would work with what we're talking about doing with the scene, and then... Ah, close one. Uh, I would probably say... There are people standing This, here yours, Mel, or... I got bad news. Mel, yours, this. He's canceling? He's canceled. But we had the what? cameras set. This is, he's supposed to come in, he's the whole Actually, one. it's, I'll, it's I'll, good I'll we're this. getting this on camera. This is <laughs> what it's not about! This is what it's about. <laughs> um, yeah, he has some melee stuff to review today. He said, let's pick him up tomorrow. 
So yeah, that's what happens. And so it's like, okay, uh, all right, that's fine. I don't care. I don't care. Um, yeah. It's just it's so much rides on one person's opinion. Like, it, it's just crazy. But this is what happens when a, a studio is kind of starting to be built around one guy. Similar issues have happened within Bethesda Game Studios with Todd Howard, apparently, where a lot of things have to go across his desk and get approval. And he's been frustrated by it. He's like, hey, we're less productive this way. We should have other people like mid-level producers and executives and gameplay designers and this and that that can make those decisions but i think for something like naughty dog and for the last of us and stuff when there's so much writing on this it's just it's not as simple as pass it off to somebody else like it, it really is about fulfilling the one guy's vision of what this is going to be unfortunately um because it slows things down a lot i think pretty clearly okay after a brief recess it is now the evening. It's like 8.30 at night. The boys are asleep. Uh, I am not streaming this. It's just you and me in the studio all alone. But I want to finish the rest of this making of The Last of Us documentary. So we're going to do that and uh we're gonna we're gonna enjoy this and i hopefully can be more focused while we finish this reaction because i won't be reading chat filled with people complaining that the documentary is too woke to be watched so <laughs> maybe we can get a little more uh a productive a session in i'm not uh, i'm not sure but let's give it a shot let's see what they they have to say in the last half <laughs> I get called up to Neil's office one day. And there's like an empty seat. And Neil just goes like, oh, just sit down. I'm like, oh my God, I did something wrong. <laughs> and he's like, um, do you know why you're here? Like, That's never a good sign. If your boss ever calls you in for that, yeah, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> Pack up your stuff, man. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, are we gonna talk about one of my levels? He's, and he laughs and he goes like, no, you're going to work on the E3 demo. It's always been a dream of mine, working on an E3 demo, seeing it on stage. Am, am I get, is this a joke? Like, no pressure. Am I getting pranked right now? So speaking of, of E3 demos, remember way back when, like you guys said you were going to block that content and then not touch it? How's that guy? Well, and then we ship just the Glock. <laughs> well, <laughs> oops. Oops, again, it just seems like Naughty Dog is a team full of hardcore perfectionists and the idea of leaving something be is is anathema to them. They just can't, they can't even tolerate the thought. Asius, best looking demo you've ever seen. We burn that to a disc at the beginning of January and then we don't touch it again and nobody sees it until E3. Well, I think, I think we, we knew at the time that we weren't going to not touch it. It's going to be really, interesting to see if we can really really commit to being done and not be tempted to say like eh, it could be a little better let's go back because the you know the game's been making progress for dude you know, i love the, this little time line swap watch the dot down, down at the bottom it bounces of back and forth we made, a lot of new ideas new mechanics and we, we really just need back. to have the discipline not to do that honestly it feels like we are addicted to being late yeah it's okay. also like i think that there is a topic of mismanagement that comes in with this like in raising kratos it was really interesting because they brought up the idea that there were issues of locking it down and moving on which is like a common thing when you're working on any project right that's collaborative you're supposed to work on a section you lock that down get it settled and then you move to the next even in the context of like the stupid stuff i do like with gaming critiques and stuff or reviews it's a process of of you know, locking that part down and moving on to the next. So it might be for like a review like Suicide Squad. I play it and then I might do a little bit of end game exploration uh, or a lot of end game exploration. And then I have notes I've taken through the game of things that, that I want to explore a little more. Maybe the menus I need to dig into or the crafting system or whatever. And I can do that and then capture all that and get notes. But then I lock it down. I'm like, okay, we have the footage that we're capturing and that's what we're doing. We have everything we need. And part of the reason we need to do that for videos is because like I have to upload it all through our servers and get it to Jacob who lives a state away. And that takes time because I can only upload it like 40 megabit per second. 
like a terabyte of data for him for one critique. So it takes time. So I have to have all that footage captured as I then move to the outline and then I lock down the outline and I need to commit to that outline because I have notes in there of timestamps and things for clips for Jacob to pull. And then I move on to the next phase, which of course is filling out the outline with actually typed out sections of the script. And then I have to lock that down and move on to the recording because if I change the script halfway through, or if we cut sections of the outline or this or that, it causes all of these other things later down the line to break where I might reference later in the, the video, as I mentioned earlier, this character has some problems and I don't like them. This is why. But if I cut the earlier reference to that, if I cut the section where I describe how I don't like that character, all of a sudden that reference doesn't really make sense. So it's, it's a common thing in creative processes that you have to lock it down and move it on. And in game development, it is that on absolute steroids because it's all built on layers and layers and layers and layers of like the core engine, basic mechanics, and then you go above mechanics to like the, the overall design of like missions and encounters and things like that. And then you have to move another layer above that. And then you're filling in the artwork and the assets and lighting and all this. And just to cut like a single element of something could cause the whole stack of cards or house of cards to come tumbling down. So hearing all of this with Naughty Dog in The Last of Us, it's really, really interesting because it makes me really wonder, like they do deliver a fantastic product at the end of the day, but they do seem to struggle with that sort of management issue. And they've gotten heat for it before, especially with Crunch, where a lot of people have complained of Crunch before and the issues that it presents. Um, and they also don't have producers. And one of the roles of producers in game development, if you see somebody that's a producer on The Last of Us Part Two, that usually involves them running around, like managing timelines and schedules, making sure this person has enough time to finish that level and what they're doing there. And then making sure that this person's schedule, who's going to take over the next step, their schedule is lined up. So they're free to take it over right as the other person finishes. And it's just a very important step that Naughty Dog just doesn't have in their studio lineup or uh, hierarchy, which is crazy. We're starting. I don't know exactly what we're going to do today other than come up with a really long list. Uh, we're Try and limit it to an hour, so we'll be done at four, no matter where we're at. Uh, looking at the cinematics first. Because we did it so early and had a ver like a rough version of it a year in advance, we got a bit complacent. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> She's a, but not quite the show. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's crazy. Sure is. Where are we on getting physics on these strands? We are working on it. So for next time? For next time? Yes, yes. Absolutely. It's just, it amazes me these little things that you just don't even necessarily notice. But they notice them and they're calling them out, making sure that they work. Like so many little details are considered. Like I always just assumed that it was like the actual strands were just kind of locked in place per scene. And then there's some combat stuff where they might move around a little, but I didn't think that there were actual physics enabled. That's crazy. We didn't scramble to figure out what it is we're gonna show. We had the structure of like the festival going into this fight in the woods in Seattle, but it was harder to build the momentum we usually have. And I think that panic just wakes everybody up and felt like it took us a bit longer to get there this time. So then you go in as if to kill this guy, see somebody over there. Oh, you know, breaks, breaks 50% of the time, but use your imagination. Daniel, yeah, going a bit slower, give him some time. Okay. The animation is breaking the uh, melee system. Okay. <laughs> so I'm confident in the demo if we finish it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a sentence. <laughs> I'm confident in the thing we're doing as long as it doesn't suck. I, yeah, I would be too. I would be too. I don't know. It's, uh, it's just crazy. Like so much of this stuff is, is like towing the line of it's totally busted. And then the next day it's working and everything's fine. And then the day after that, they break it again with some change they made. And it's just, that that's game development. It, I'll be frank, it's not looking great. All right, this is totally broken. Let's, for next week, let's make sure it's all there so we could actually review it. Yep. 
Uh, okay, thanks, everyone. I feel like this demo is cursed. Dude, the awkwardness of like being the guy in charge of that level, and then you go to the review and it's just not working. Like I remember one time I had a presentation at work and well, it was technically me and like two other guys that were hired with me, but we had like a little bitty presentation where we we're just gonna like go and do this thing and uh, showcase the the research we had done on this, this like um, sub community in Colorado Springs and uh, another section on Denver. And like the whole thing was just a nightmare. Like everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. Like the slides were corrupted and then the backup we had on Google Drive wasn't working because the internet wasn't working properly. And like every possible thing that could have gone wrong went wrong. And uh, the boss also was having a terrible day and he like low key kind of threatened to fire everybody. There were just so many things that were horrible and it just made you feel dreadful. And I, I would worry that with something like video game development, it would just be a constant thing. Like you'd always feel that way because there's always stuff breaking, you know, like it's gotta be so damn stressful. I think there's a reason the only type of job that makes somebody's hair go gray faster than like being president of the United States is seemingly gaming development because like you see neil Druckmann, he starts like 2013 long fluming locks of of brown hair i was gonna say auburn hair but that wouldn't be accurate uh and brown hair and then like by the time we hit 2016 in this documentary he's starting to get a little gray and now he's like full salt and pepper it's it's crazy it's crazy granted it's been like 10 years since then but still like that's that's a pretty big transformation The E3 demo it was a version of our original green light demo. Scour. But I had to make it fully playable and shippable. Viper. <laughs> the first thing I did was just basically take that space made by another level designer and put just enemies in it and start fighting. But when I started playing, it, I remember like it just it wasn't there. That parking structure was way smaller, so it felt it felt more cramped. God is good. God is good. I remember going to Neil's office and being like, how much can I change this? And he's like, well, what are you thinking? And I'm like, well, I'm thinking like this big thing. And I'm like, just like brand new designer. I'm just throwing out like everything. Like, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to make sure that feels like a sandbox, that it feels like this big space, that it's multiple paths. It's like something like we really haven't done before in The Last of Us. And he just goes, go for it. Well, let's do it. Don't screw it up too much. We picked a location in Seattle that essentially is probably the hardest lighting scenario we would have to pull off in the game. I wanted to get the overcast look nailed because so much of the game's dependent on that. How do we pull off this look? Can we pull off this look? Everything felt a little muted and it, we were losing kind of that next gen quality of our engine. Like for a second, we actually turned the sun on in the demo. But we lost the mood of that overcast kind of blue look. That moment was uh, really rough for me. Just felt like years of my life that potentially would have just been like wasted on this, this pipe dream of, of a look. Well, we were struggling with like so last summer. We were, it was like a fine balancing act. Is this whole thing just gonna crumble? Like, is the whole direction like now gonna have to change for the game, not just this demo? Have I steered this company wrong? Took some really big iterations and tried some crazy ideas and we came up with kind of a hack. We talked with the programmers and found a few settings that actually gave us exactly what we wanted. It was really like one thing. We faked the sunlight within this kind of ambient look so we could get some directionality of the lighting. But it was like, it is a good point. Like I remember seeing a discussion, I think it was with, I think it was with regards to uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And one of the lighting designers was talking about the difficulty of making something look like it's at nighttime, even though actually lighting it accurately as if it were nighttime would not look good on 99% of people's TVs, right? Like if you were to actually do it realistically, it wouldn't look very good it would be very dark difficult to figure out what's going on it wouldn't actually work properly with all of it i think it's it's interesting just to think of the steps that they have to go through to mimic 
not necessarily what is accurate to an overcast day, but what we would interpret as an overcast day. Because there is a difference, you know, what what appears to us one way isn't necessarily what um, is in realism uh, re or realistic terms completely accurate. You know, there's there's a, a difference there, just like with a lot of people like the sound of punching, you know, the, the stereotypical movie TV show sound of punching. It's like this big kind of snappy sound. And it's not actually accurate. Like if you've ever been in a fight or if you've ever like hopefully not been punched or done some punching yourself, it doesn't sound like that. Like it, it is skin on skin. That's what it sounds like. It's a really muted, but that's not very satisfying. And so when Foley sound designers go in there and do the Foley capture for films, TV shows, games, whatever, they do what we would expect to hear and what our brain has kind of been conditioned and trained to think is a punch, even if it isn't completely accurate to what you would expect, which I just find interesting. And it seems like a similar thing is going on here where they're trying to do what is perhaps what our brain would interpret as an overcast state, even if it isn't necessarily accurate. Oh, if we do this one thing, it actually got us the look we wanted. So, like, I'm glad that happened. For this game, uh, there was a major push to make a new uh, volumetric fog system. It's not just like a kind of an overlay on top of the screen. You, that's why it's called volumetric. You feel the volume of it. It's going to be a little bit thicker near the ground, right? Because there, you know, and you will see grass kind of getting through it. Fog also allows you to see the light. Fog adds atmosphere. Atmosphere brings everything together. Now with this game, we did add recently some new tech that allows us to make some of the water drips more dynamic, meaning that if you have a car, you will see a water, follow the glass, follow the hood, and then from the bumper, you're gonna start seeing dynamic droplets. Um, so that was really cool. It does look crazy and then good, we can now today. actually also use this technology to drive blood. Now we can have blood dripping and we have water oh, yeah. dripping i remember the first time i realized that the blood would actually drip down her jacket after being hit with an arrow it, it like broke my brain it broke my brain in the same way that like the first time i played grand theft auto 5 and i took michael and i walked michael into the ocean up to like basically belly button midriff height and uh then i walked him back onto the beach out of the water and the wetness stayed on his clothes at that height. I, rem I remember that just broke my brain. I was like, how did they do that? that is magic? Cause it was one of those things that like, if it weren't there, I probably wouldn't even really think about it. But when you notice it, it's like, holy crap. You know, it's same with like Red Dead 2 with the horses pooping. Like, did they need to put that in the game? No, but when it's there, you're like, that's kind of cool. Like they didn't have to do that. That's a good touch, a little realism drip right there. And this stuff, it's the same thing. It's so cool the water trail can pick up where is it bloody. And if it's bloody, it can change its, uh, its own color and start dripping more red. And on top of it, we also clear out the blood. So what you will see is you will see bloody area, you will see water trails going down, and you will see the water trails washing out the blood and picking up the redness and going down. Really, really cool. In the E3 demo, we do want to show our next-gen animation system. Bear in mind, this was next gen for One the PS4. One of the biggest animation upgrades that we wanted to add to this project was uh, motion matching. The way that it works is it takes a pool of animation data and it picks the most appropriate clip to uh, blend together and create just very fluid and organic movement. Yeah. We want these characters to just feel grounded and believable in the world, properly shifting their weight and moving the way a real human would. Yeah, it is on another level. And like the the best example of when this is not working right would be like, honestly, the, uh, the Silent Hill 2 remake trailer that they recently dropped, the really stiff movement. And it's just, I mean, the environments from Team Bluebird look great, but their animations for movement have always been super, super stiff. And it's... A similar thing with like Starfield does not have this same thing where like Starfield, they always run the same way regardless really of 
of what they're doing or shifting and uh, whether the weight's moving. And I get it. Not every game can have this type of thing, but I do think we're moving towards a, a an industry where AAA games, stuff like this is just going to be the mainstay. And so I, I fully expect that like a lot of future Ubisoft games are going to feature this uh, tech. And of course, everything from Rockstar is going to feature this tech. And I, I think that this is going to be the mainstay for most of these animation sets. Because as like the years go by, the bar gets raised for everything, everything. In order to capture all of those on the stage, we use something called a dance card, a choreographed set of patterns that the actor can move on the floor. Basically, that's creating this like bank of little pieces of animation. The motion matching system just pulls from that bank all the animations necessary to have them move perfectly in any arbitrary way. When it works, it's like so far and away better than any other animation it's technique. Crazy. It's like a, a quantum leap of the yeah. highest order in terms of quality. It really is. The difference between the old style of doing things and this is night and day. It's just not even close. Any one mechanic is not any, maybe anything you haven't seen before. It's the combination of how it all comes together, the way it works with the animation system. The new stuff we're talking about is like, oh, you can be in grass. She went into the grass. Watch yourself. Like one of the biggest things we do in the demo is jump a gap. <laughs> It's tough to be like, oh crap, you can jump, you know, like it's like, but it's new to our game. We have to have the best prone mechanic of all time. <laughs> yeah, no one's ever seen when I aim in prone and she actually like rolls up on her back and aims like this. Like it can never clip through geometry. Being able to rotate 360 in all directions. It can never, like, do a janky thing when she's reloading while doing it or aiming in water. It's like an IK thing that, like, lift her chest and head up, and then it gets too deep. Now we're in a special prone underwater moveset thing. It's wild. Her chest and arms and everything are kind of matching ground. That's a good point. Like, I had never really thought of that, but when she's prone near water, the water doesn't immediately go to a depth. It usually tapers in. So they had to specifically have a rule set to code like the animation uh, or the rig to lift her chest higher while being prone to keep her head and mouth and nose out of the water. Because otherwise, if she was at the same level she is when she's going prone, she sticks to the bottom of the ground and she would just start drowning herself without it really acknowledging it. So they had to specifically account for that. All these little touches, man, it just blows my mind. It really makes you appreciate it. Like whenever people are talking about the last of us part two and they're like, Oh, well the gameplay is really lackluster. I'm like, okay, tell me you didn't, you didn't play it <laughs> like without telling me you didn't play it. Cause it's crazy, man. There's so much stuff here. I'm playing things that, that a player will never notice. And it's because we like purposely did it. There's no such thing as like, Oh, you know, it's not as good as, you know, this other game's one, but like, it's fine. It's got like, no, we, it's fucking Naughty Dog. We have to have the best version of the thing, whatever that is. E3 overall was... Dude, I... I miss E3. I went in 2019 and it's really cool. I do remember the most stark thing though, was like we were over here and the, the convention centers here. There's a bunch of cool restaurants over here. Uh, a bunch of like YouTubers and streamers met with fans there, which is why I was hoping that they would do E3 again so that we could all go and do meetups and stuff. I think it'd be super fun, but we'll have to do it at PAX or something else. But um, there was a lot of stuff and like, this is the back entrance. I think we met, yeah, I think Matt, Pat, we met over here on the far side on the back end. And it was like, it, it was super cool. I mean, he's a super chill guy. Actually, maybe it was back here. It was on the back side of the, the lot, I recall. But anyway, so we, uh, like this whole place is crazy. But the one thing I remember that really struck me is like all of this was super cool. There are these like tunnels that go under the walkway and everything. It's super cool. But back on the back side, so I guess it, it must have been back here that we were. There's like a, a bridge that goes over top with the, the highway. And all through here, all through here were nothing but tents filled with like homeless people and drug addicts, like nothing, but they, they just would like use the toilet in the street 
they would, I mean, it was crazy. But I remember the thing that struck me the most is that we were standing up here after going through the little security thing for the special access. And we're looking back, just waiting for whatever we were waiting for. And I remember seeing those tents and we were talking about it. And then right through the middle of them drives like a brand spanking new Bugatti, like a $300,000 car minimum. Like this thing was, was brand new. And seeing that drive through the, the utter like poverty directly next to the overwhelming wealth of being able to spend more than the vast majority of people's houses, <laughs> like maybe twice the amount of their house, if they even have a house, like driving that right next to all these people that don't have money to like so much as stay in a motel six. It, it just blew me away. It was very, very stark. And there's stuff like that all over Los Angeles. It was really, really striking. I know that has nothing to do with what we're doing here specifically, but, um, yeah, it's what I thought of, so. Sorry, moving on. <laughs> it was amazing. The press conference was in a very different venue. They usually have them in like these big auditoriums. And this was kind of like, almost like a pop-up. It was more like a theme park idea, but it's like in a parking lot, in a tent, in Los Angeles at downtown. I remember this. They had built the whole crazy really weird. <laughs> church thing, which was pretty rad. It was super cool. It was better than we expected. Like it was a really cool concept to like recreate the scene from the game in real life. And it showed like their commitment to this game and Sony's commitment to marketing it and putting it, you know, in a good light. But I, if I recall correctly, they had the regular Sony show and then there was like a break and then they transitioned over to this and then they had this show in this separate building. So it's like everybody had to move over, which was just a little, a little stark. Is this Gus from Rooster Teeth? can't tell. No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I was going to say, if that was Gus from Rooster Teeth, he's the guy that's like spent all that money on Star Citizen. Uh, <laughs> it's like the one thing I really know him for is that he talked very openly about spending thousands and thousands on Star Citizen ships like five years ago before like today it's, it's kind of a stretch to spend that much money in Star Citizen kind of as being kind of an understatement, but he was doing that five years ago, which is crazy. And you could feel like the tension of people trying to figure out what is this press conference? What's going on? Dude, I, for real, I'd be like, what the hell is happening? I don't, I don't know. I, I would be, I'd be losing it. On what game are they going to show here? On the Naughty Dog logo, you get this big cheer. On the Ellie Reveal, you get this big cheer. Every moment that we've constructed and planned, like, meticulously for really a year now, hit and hit the way we wanted it to hit. Maybe they're jealous of you. I'm just a girl, not a threat. Oh, but you I are. I should be terrified of you. So visceral. It's crazy. Fucker. <laughs> the little insult. Yeah, the realization that One it was One of the biggest play. reactions was when the HUD came on. Little frogs jumping. They looked at that forest and thought, there's no way it can look this good. Like, that's impossible. But when we flash the HUD and be like, yeah, that's it. This is the real game. People are not ready for this. Like, this is going to fuck you up. 
was electric. My skin was like tingling the whole time. Like as soon as it's done playing, I'm like on my phone. And it was wild. It was wild to see it just everywhere. See it on YouTube, see people commenting on it. <laughs> it's looking ruthless and gay. <laughs> oh, it, it, was, it was a really special moment. I shipped something, like, as a level designer. There was such a reaction to the animation fidelity. Holy crap, this is the best looking animation I've ever seen. Are you kidding me? We're on the forums going through the messages, seeing how much people think it's amazing. Someone's like, sort of cynically, that our stuff was fake. I guess it's kind of a compliment to the animation team for, like, someone to say it's fake when they're working so hard. And right away, I responded, I was like, don't respond, don't do anything, like, it's just, not professional. I was also a little anxious about it because it's a little fake, <laughs> you know? Fake is an interesting word. There's an argument that he's right. It's not the final Polish game. You can't just play this demo in any way. You have to play it in this very specific way. But before we even show the demo, it's like, let's not put anything in there we feel like we can't do. There was no thing of like, we don't know how we're going to do that. It was just, we literally just don't have it systemic yet. You know, like systemically, a guy pulling you out from underneath a car, we didn't have that hooked up yet. Now we have it hooked up in the game. It's her! All over the ceiling. Ultimately, as we're building the rest of the game, if anything feels like it's not the right call for the game, we don't mind changing it. Like, we had certain things in the demo for the first Last of Us where, like, Joel picks up a pistol and takes out individual bullets from it and then pockets it. And, like, we could have done that. It just took too long. So for gameplay purposes, we cut that out. I was talking to... That's kind of cool. I didn't know that. That's crazy. It's the same thing, though. Like, sometimes realism is not necessarily fun. Like, just because you can do it that way doesn't mean you should. And I mean, ammo pickups are a great example um, of this just because <laughs> it's also like with like rifles, you know, you might have a mag with 30 rounds in it. You fire three rounds in a game. You can just hit reload and it preserves the 27 you didn't fire still has that in your total. But he dumps the whole mag, puts a new one in and then you're ready to go when that's not actually what would happen. He just threw away 27 rounds on the ground and then lost those some games will do that and do have that element of realism but a lot of more like pop culture games don't do that because it's not actually that fun and it it can add another layer of stress that maybe you're not going for to be stressing about like well i don't want to reload till the mag is completely empty so i don't know if behind this door is going to be 10 people and i'm only going to have one round ready to go so yeah it's it's an interesting concept though other animators and they were like, yeah, man, they think it's fake. They have no idea. Like, it's awesome. The same animators who made this demo are going to make the final game. So, like, I don't know what you're talking about. They were confident, which I'm glad. We knew what we were doing and we knew how special it was. It was a little bit of a microphone drop to the industry. And for many, it was inspirational. And they were excited to uh, be able to add some of those details to their games and their future games. And for some of them, it absolutely freaked them out to see this might be the new bar that's expected for uh, other games to follow. But that's what you need. And I, I think that's kind of been the bummer with Naughty Dog uh, being AFK working on this online game that now is never going to see the light of day other than maybe in a documentary like this for whatever their next game is. So I think it's important for these types of groups and companies to showcase their best stuff and to call the, the industry out and be like, 
no, you got to take it up a notch. Like we're just getting started. This is where we're at. We're only going to crank the knobs harder and you got to step up. You got to step up. It's the same reason why people started freaking out when Baldur's Gate 3 dropped. Everybody was like, oh my God. Anybody who's thinking of working on an RPG started to really get stressed. Cause like, okay, if that's what people are going to expect, we're, we're, we might be screwed. Part of me is like, oh shit. Like they're fucking calling us out. It's like, we have to deliver this. Like we always were gonna, but now it's like people have called us out. So we have to do a full body throw animation when you pick up a bottle and you're running and not just a partial animation because that guy fucking called us out. The real challenge is making the whole game look as good as this one controlled situation. We come out of E3 and, and hopefully we've set the standard for this, what the rest of the game needs to feel like. Be tricky though. When you already know exactly what you're supposed to do in the game, you've memorized everything, it's hard to have a true experience with it. They have to bring in people from the outside to play it fresh. And so we try to start playtesting as early as possible. We've got testers in bright and early. They're going to start playing the game. They're actually just right across the hall over here. It is a fire drill. Because things have to work. Oops. I remember seeing this in the God of War documentary too, when they were doing these play tests and they take the feedback and they do work with it. They're like, okay, they said a trace is way too OP. And then in another play test, they're like, oh no, Atreus is way too dumbed down. He's not useful at all. He's just kind of a waste of space. So then they have to tune it around that feedback. And there are some studios who, at least in years past, have been very anti-play test. Uh, famously Bethesda going into Fallout 4, they said that they don't do any play tests from outside. Like they, as a studio, play it. And they're like, we have hundreds of people playing it that work with us and work on the game. That's enough. But I think that that's a dangerous, <laughs> a dangerous thing. Cause what happens when you work on anything, and if you've ever worked on anything for an extended period of time, you know this, you get like blinders on, you start to, to miss out on things that might've been obvious to somebody else, just thinking outside the box. And that's why bringing in fresh perspectives can be really, really useful. So I'm currently watching the 10 people that we have in at the moment, focus testing. We've got all of their screens up, um, so I can kind of watch all of them at the same time, generally keep track of any kind of recurring patterns or how long people generally take in certain areas. They do things we haven't thought of, and it really shows us where our holes are. It's like, hmm, maybe I should change this. Maybe I should try that. This player's pretty lost, trying to figure out this puzzle here, and they're trying to jump on a truck. He's got a really awesome solution here where he's putting this plank on a dumpster and now he's moving the dumpster around so we'll probably <laughs> the whole time he's like what the hell is this guy doing so stupid i have to go in there and like try and fix some of that stuff up but we'd rather figure that out now than in six months for things like puzzles like this one that although they're figuring out the puzzle they're not actually not doing it in the kind of order that i'd like what would be better is if they came into the space and realize, okay, that's the thing I need to be um, like climbing up to or getting to. And then they can kind of work backwards from there and go, well, if I need to get there, how do I get up? Oh, I can get up on this thing. It's quite heartbreaking when you see people who are like really confused or don't get it. And it's something you think like it should be obvious, but it's not at all. But it's good data. 
<laughs> but no more than any game. Like I get lost. We've had a, a few lot. people on the team that have been really passionate about making our games even more accessible for people with different kinds of disabilities and making sure as many people as possible can experience our game. Accessibility is something that like really touches a lot of people. As we get older, pretty much all of us are going to have probably some sort of accessibility need. It's important to welcome people with disabilities into all of our public spaces, into our shared culture, and that video games are a, a rich part of that. I, I love this, that you don't have to have like a two button feature to keep her crouched down. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is awesome, I love that. Nice. Brandon Cole, he said, I, I heard you announce this game. What do you think about the possibility of someone like myself being able to play it and Brandon is blind? I hadn't really thought about that before. I, I don't even know if that's even possible, but I want to try because that sounds interesting. If you click on the L3 button, it turns the screen and the character towards your um, ne next objective. Uh -huh. So you're able to sort of instantly sort of flip. I was very much inspired by the, uh, the talk you gave last time you were here. I figured, so I figured. Hopefully that's, that's, that's a beautiful thing. We had this feature that let you navigate along the golden path. And we also had this other feature. You could like put out this sonar pulse and you'd hear where all the items and enemies were located. But Brandon was playing oh, that cool. and it was like, this navigation feature is great, but I don't want to just follow the golden path. I want to navigate to other things. It kind of occurred to us like, oh, we can combine these two features. We can let you scan for items and then navigate to that item. This gives you more room if you do it this way for different types of sounds for different types of items, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Different awesome. sound for ammo, different sound for parts, different sound for explosive, different sound for keys. Or you the, uh, craftable yes. and collectible. Yes, uh, yes, exactly. Right on. But That's since cool. we want to hunt for secrets, just like anyone else, you're also going to want to know that, hey, there's something way over there. Players with disabilities still want to have challenge. It's not about just making an easy mode. Mm -hmm. So what happened there was a... Yeah, I remember when this, when The Last of Us 2 dropped, there were so many people that were just committed to being nasty about it. I had one guy, I don't know why I still remember this comment, because it was one comment out of like thousands and thousands. So like, who gives a crap? But it was one guy who was just kind of a, a major prick. And, you know, he had the, the full list of nasty nasty stuff it was like you know like homophobic stuff transphobic stuff there was something in there about th this being a coded thing that was anti-christian like there were so many weird things that he was going off about that i do not think were indicative of most people just to be completely clear Th this stood out because it was so weird and exceptional compared to how how 99 percent of people think and talk but he was saying that he was upset they had like focused so much on accessibility he's like this is just another example of of like woke media companies focusing on diversity instead of just making a good game and i remember like he just freaked out he had paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of stuff and i was like what how selfish of a person to like try to gatekeep video games to only people that like have have good enough vision that have uh proper like like normal hearing or whatever that don't have color blindness or like my cousin is colorblind there are some games that he tries to play and if the ui is set up in a certain way he can't distinguish like the text properly so he will actively struggle with it or certain games if the gradients of color are, are a certain way he can't like distinguish between objects properly like it, it's really fascinating I, i'm fascinated by it. it's super cool to me but there are many games that take steps to try and include those people in this hobby that we all know and love and i think that's great i think it's awesome and if anybody ever that you see out there i think we all should commit to this together if you ever see somebody that's being so nasty and vindictive and vitriolic towards somebody who has a disability because a company had the gall to provide them accessibility features i think they need to be called out call them out like what a pathetic loser you are to be upset about more people getting to play these games what a prick again i don't know why i remember that one comment from that guy all these years later but there there are a handful of comments throughout the years that have stuck with me i'm like oh why do I remember that? Like, there's plenty of nice comments that came through, you know, thousands and thousands of them, but every, like, it's always like the, a random nasty comment that sticks with me. I don't know why. Auto Ooh. vault. So Ooh. you pressed into a wall and it automatically vaulted. I feel happy about this. 
this is an example of actually the good part of the studio culture, which is self-empowered, that, that I think allowed us to do this crazy thing, this thing that, you know, I couldn't tell you if it makes business sense to some degree, but, but it was something we were passionate about and interested in. It was a way we saw we could make the game better. It was something we saw we could, like, push the frontiers of, and we went with it. Studio leadership was supportive of us, but this really was like a bottom-up kind of initiative. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that early success um, really helped to build momentum for the rest of the project. Shielding everybody from the cost, from the budget of these decisions helps them focus on their discipline. Don't worry about money, worry about making the best game possible. Trust that there are people at the top that are looking at the budget and considering that. At a certain point in the project, we start offering dinners to the team. Are they going to talk about crunch? Uh, and it's kind of like an acknowledgement of like, OK, there's a lot of hard work to get it done. And we know people are probably going to want to be staying late. Now we are crunching. This is crunch. This is crunch. Delay of game. I mean, we'll see if they touch on it. I kind of doubt they will. But they, one of the discussions from interviews with Naughty Dog employees, current and former, I, I think it maybe was a Jason Schreier article where he did it, but it, it was a, an, a sort of expose interviewing those people, of course, anonymously, but they were saying that Naughty Dog executives and leadership never like said you need to stay until 9 p.m. Or, or like, I know technically the workday is over at five, but you need to stay till seven or eight to finish this up with the rest of the team. They never would say that, but they would always phrase it as, well, we're a team working on this game together. And, you know, we, we would hope that we could all be united as a team working to finish this game together and you know kind of hemming and hawing basically saying if you choose to go home at five you're not a real member of the team because you're not sticking it out with everybody else and i felt that in in my work life the job before this like we would be in the office and the owner uh, like the head honcho he would come in usually late around like 10 11 a.m and he would uh work late so he'd still put in you know even though the dude's loaded could retire easily he would work a full day if not more than a full day i mean he worked till probably 8 9 p.m but he'd come in a little bit late but we would come in at like 8 8 30 and uh it was expected for us to stay late or at least as late as the boss the big guy was staying because at the end of the day before he hopped in his whatever like model s plaid or whatever and drove home he would walk through the whole office looking around to see everybody. And the understanding was, if you wanted to climb that ladder, if you wanted to last, you needed to be there when he did his walk. You needed to be the guy that was still working after everyone else went home. So you didn't have to stay, but guess what? If you didn't stay, if you went home when you were supposed to go home, you would be the, the guy that sticks out as not as committed as the other guys. You know, so it it's this passive aggressive peer pressure type of crunch that that I dealt with. And apparently it's a similar thing at Naughty Dog. I mean, if they're truly passionate, like if you're truly passionate about your work, it doesn't really feel like work. So you'll work extra hours regardless, like for YouTube videos and streams. Like right now it's 9, 15 PM and I'm here recording a video technically for the live channel, but this doesn't feel like work. Part of it's because this isn't like, let's be honest, this isn't a real job. I'm just like goofing around and getting paid for it. It's outrageous that this is a thing, but uh, because it's like not work to me, it doesn't feel like I'm technically crunching and putting in extra hours after, you know, um, starting the work day at like 9 a.m. this morning to still be going at this point. Technically, I guess I'm working more than full time, but again, this isn't a real job. Let's just be honest about that. <laughs> I must have felt it for months that this release date is not realistic with how big the game is. People were asking us, is this a real date? Because it's not feeling like a real date anymore. So we felt like we had to react pretty soon. 
And then at some point it just felt like because people were starting to put in longer hours, it wouldn't have been fair to not figure this stuff out sooner than later. Are we ever gonna finish this game? If you work hard for longer, that could have a toll on you. We tell everybody, pace yourselves. It's like, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. We settled on a February release date. Okay. Leave some gas in the tank. Okay. Nothing, nothing right bad at all is going to happen around that time. February of 2020. Everything will be fine. Don't worry. Uh, we are dancing a very intricate and dangerous dance. We have something like six months left to finish the game. Uh, and we are also showing a demo to the press. The longest playable demo we've ever done. Two separate levels of the game. A level towards the beginning of the game where you play with Dina on patrol outside of Jackson. And then the second part of the demo is in a level super duper challenging. Ellie by herself, murder mode. So what we're doing for the press in nine weeks is really those two levels of the game. It's unlikely that we're gonna need to touch them again until the game shifts. That was really the only kind of demo that we could do at this point that would still help further our production goals as well as give us this like marketing boost that, that we need. The more we talked about, it, the more we convinced ourselves, okay, this would actually be a good time to just put up a trailer. Building these two major demos and a trailer next to the rest of the fucking game. And it felt impossible early on. I mean, it's the thing that's always hard for us to polish. You review these things and we're looking at all these tiny details. It's like, even that shot of Jackson is like, where should the trees be? How much fog should it be? How much sun should it be? How should the sun hit the clouds? How we get all these civilians, the kids, do they have the proper gear? Are they wearing the right clothes? Uh, is the tractor leaving tracks on the ground? Even little shit, like, did you just see that? They have the proper gear, are they wearing the... So not only does the, the flesh of the, the animal have to move as it walks, but watch the, right the logs. Uh, like, as the tractor drives, the logs are moving. They could have gone and just been like, hey, the logs are going to stay still because they're strapped down. They're strapped down, so they're not going to move. But instead, they go that extra little step to make the logs on the top a little loose so that they wiggle around as it drives. I think the danger with this is that sometimes perfectionists don't know when to stop. And that's kind of been the theme of all of this. I don't think anybody would have cared. Like that probably took an extra, like an animator, if it was hand keyed and it's, it's not physics based, maybe it's physics based, but if it was hand keyed, like that could have taken them an afternoon to like really get right when nobody would have cared. If it was just strapped down tight, put an extra log right there, it's strapped on tight. It doesn't move. No one would ever notice. Like, and if they watch this trailer and their takeaway was, <clears throat> whoa, Jesus, choked in my own throat. Uh, <laughs> if they watch this trailer and they were like, uh, well, it was pretty cool, but the logs didn't jiggle enough. Then like you were never going to win those people over. But it reminds me of a time I was doing a play called On Golden Pond and it was from a now defunct uh like a theater company called pop-up theater and the director of the show very very nice guy you know very nice guy he looked like santa claus basically had a problem with not knowing when to stop like he was a perfectionist in the same way where he wanted to have everything precisely as he envisioned it so the way that this kind of worked is like we had a stage that was kind of like this and um so it was if I recall, it was kind of like, you know, a kind of a walkway. It was almost like a cross, uh, but it was like big walkway out here and there's chairs and everything here. So this is where the audience is. You know, the audience is all in here, all in here. It was a found space. So it wasn't like a typical theater. It was in like a big ballroom. But then there was also like a big platform that went like this. And it was supposed to be like the dock of the uh house going out to the lake over here and then this is the the like actual house 
with, you know, little windows were hung and then there's like a door here. But the whole show was basically blocked so it could be performed in this area. However, there were also seats over here and there was another walkway that went off at the back towards like the dressing rooms. And there were seats over here. But in the whole run, we never had like a sold out night because it was kind of like a clunky show. Didn't it? I think it broke even, but it didn't do super, super well. But no one, I think in the entire run of the show, sat on this side. No one did. The whole run. So we blocked most of the show over here because this is what, you know, people would walk in from over here from the entrance and they would kind of fill in this first, then move over here, fill in this second. And then if there was overfill, they would go back here. But in the whole run, people were only ever here and here. But the director, he didn't know when to stop. So even after the first couple of performances, and we knew that, okay, no one's ever going to sit over here. We could like cut these chairs and it would be fine. He went to an antique shop and he got like an old vintage bucket and put it here. And he spent hundreds of dollars on antique fishing rods that came out of it over here. Cause this was supposed to be kind of like a reverse mirror image of the dock over here, right? No one in the entire run of the show saw this stuff. No one. And yet he probably spent like four or 500 bucks of the, the, the play's budget, which the total budget for the play was maybe like five grand. He spent like 10% of the budget close to it on something the audience never saw a total waste. Not even that they like passively added to the show. It's like an investment in training the actors, nothing like that. It was just a total waste. It didn't go anywhere. It didn't do anything. It wasn't functional. Nobody saw it. Nobody cared. And I think with a lot of perfectionists, the danger is that similar stuff can happen if you don't know when to stop. And that's why you have to have a director and managers uh, and producers that can step in and be like jiggling logs, not a priority. Maybe we do it if we have extra time. Maybe they did have extra time, but it's little stuff like this when they're they're saying how frustrated they are with not knowing when to stop and being perfectionists and stuff. And then you see little touches like that. It's like, well, there's your problem. There's your problem. No one would have cared if the logs didn't move, but you took that extra step. And it's cool that you did, but you didn't need to do that. Nobody would have cared. Tractor leaving tracks on the ground. That kind of crazy detail could only come through all these departments coming together and rising this occasion to achieve that kind of level of quality. It's a vanilla shake. It's delicious. We wanted to show the team the final trailer. Before we show you the trailer, just to say thank you to everyone, where we jumped from doing a three hour demo to this trailer where we had almost nothing. And it's like a pretty amazing what we can do when we all come together. In fact, it's so amazing you can forget. And I've been here for a long time and I can forget. So to remind you and maybe reignite some of that panic, uh, we're gonna show you two trailers. One from exactly a month ago and one from about an hour ago when we wrapped up the trailer. <laughs> so enjoy. <laughs> Look who decided to join us. <laughs> All right, we all know the drill. <laughs> Tina, where are you? <laughs> Scarring. You think I'd let you do this on your own? Full slide. Don't like it's one clap. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is what the whole game's gonna look like. We're gonna make it this awesome. <laughs> Let's see it. You can't stop this. This was a good reminder. Look, when we come together, when we rise to the occasion, when we do this thing that people outside the studio talk about, like this Naughty Dog magic, this is what it looks like. So when you look at parts of the game that aren't there yet, know that we could get there in a pretty short period of time when we're so focused. The date was the scariest part of the <laughs> <laughs> We got the trailer done. We'll talk right. to it's crazy. I wanted to take this moment to run through the events of Outbreak Week, which is when the trailer is going to debut. We are going to be having the big press event in Koreatown at this giant warehouse. 
We actually are having 80 journalists from all over the world come. We got to make sure very comfortable chairs for three hours. Three hours, baby. These press events are super cool. They're super cool. Uh, this is the first time I've seen the footage from this one. You know, usually it's the one we did for Avatar was kind of awkward because like you wear the headset and they had it set up so that you would have a demoist helping you and they wore a, a headset as well and they stood behind you while you played. So like behind this person would be the demoist uh, that's like walking you through it if you need help. And their headset has a microphone and if they talk in that headset it goes to your headphones so you can still hear the game fully but you can also hear them through basically a voice chat and it can be useful and hand like handy but when i went uh to that avatar thing the voice chat wasn't working so the guy would like try to say something to help but it would just be like uh, that, uh, this is l3 and this is square couldn't tell anything it was crazy it was, it was like okay maybe this this Probably should have double checked that this was working before, but <laughs> can't can't hear a damn thing. Break day is the day the outbreak happened in the United States in 2013. In real life, we celebrate September 26th as Last of Us Day. Every September 26th, we've done something for Last of Us fans. When people play these two sections, which are very different, I hope and I feel that both of them are equally impressive. When you play that first demo, you're like, that was incredible. Oh my God. This could have been the whole demo. This could have been the whole thing. It says enough about what the game is. And then you play the other half, and it's like way more mechanics heavy, way more combat heavy. Keep going, boy. In the highest level of I just did this how level Naughty Dog too. is perceived as a company, it's that we're story first and mechanic second. A lot of it is, I think, proving to the press and proving to people that, yes, we can do both. I, I want people to walk around and say, this is the best controlling, this is the best feeling third person shooter. It's on the level of the best action stealth games you've ever played. So one of the things that I've always found really exciting about The Last of Us is the kind of fidelity with which we represent human intelligence. One of the ways that really helped make them feel more human and more alive was the way that they use their body language to communicate to each other. Everybody spread out. We may have multiples. We had a number of sessions where the animation team, design team, and programmers all got together and we acted out a number of scenarios. And what that does is it gives us really great reference and touch points that we can always look back to about the way that we naturally behave, the way we naturally respond to each other. And those are the types of details that we want to weave back into the game. Someone took out Zoe! Who the fuck's out there? Sweep the whole goddamn street. For me, it was that they were Our named. Our NPCs That's are what, named, yeah. so that you understand these people have relationships. They want to get revenge on you. It's this little, little mini loop of the whole premise of the game. Omar, Blanker. I just killed their friend, and they want to kill me now. Omar. There's a cost. You killed that person. His friend now feels a loss. You know, his dog is now alone. The whimper. Dogs are really difficult to start off with because they're quadrupeds. They just don't turn around. They kind of like wheel around a little bit. Smell something, girl? The main concern we had is how oh, is it that we can actually suits. get a dog to perform a dance card on the motion capture set? And when we finally brought them on set, it was just incredible what these dogs were capable of doing and what the trainers were able to to accomplish in a short time. Jump, 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 jump! Oh, yeah. boy, there you go. <laughs> they move extremely quickly, uh, so they're super hard to shoot. Right here! Uh, fuck! <laughs> they are very low to the ground. You have like these attacks that are designed to go up here, and now you have to kind of do them down there. Killing a dog has 
gotten people more like upset than anything else in the game, than hanging people, than eviscerating people. We're gonna break new ground in dog murder. Dude, for real. <laughs> start like two months ago. First question, she walks into the middle of the room. I have one question. Does the dog survive? And everyone's like, oh no, first day, first day, first day, first day. <laughs> so we killed it, and then you have to love it knowing that it's already dead. So there's gonna probably be people that are upset about that. And you can throw tennis yeah. balls for it too. Go to the trucks? Let's go to the trucks. With the notable exception. I don't think it's technically that dog. You throw tennis balls for this dog. Of Alice. We took great pains to ensure that every combat encounter that you fight against a dog, uh, you do not have to kill any of them. When uh, I was playing the game on Grounded in this encounter, I didn't kill a single person or animal because I like it just it wouldn't have worked. So I had to stealth all the way around the outside across. It took me like 30 minutes. It was a whole thing. If you ever want to like really give yourself a migraine, play this game on Grounded. It's It'll break you. It will break you. But yeah, if you guys remember Cami, if you guys have been around for a while, um, like three, four years, back when this game came out, I was doing a lot of collaborations with, with Cami. She was somebody I worked with um, on the channel. Me, Jacob and Cami did a, a series called Knit Grit, which was kind of a, a failed experiment of a new show, kind of collaborative thing um, on the channel. But we we did that for a while around the time that The Last of Us Part Two launched. And it was really, really interesting. Like, cause she said straight up, she could not kill any of the dogs in The Last of Us Part Two. That was where she like drew the line. It is funny that like killing people you're okay with but animals you struggle with but i think it's because the animals like they didn't do anything wrong they don't have the same hatred or malice or or evil or anything they just are like they've been trained to do something and they follow their owners blindly and you know they're they're compa or rather companions blindly so it's not quite the same but i've always thought that was interesting that like killing a dog it, it, like evokes more of a visceral reaction from uh, people than killing a human which is just fascinating uh, it's more palatable to kill people because they're all there because they choose to be there. Uh, but all of these. Not necessarily, though. Like, not necessarily. In this case, it's like these people are just walking around patrolling territory that they have uh, and that they control to keep infected out. And then Ellie shows up and just starts killing people. Like, it's not always that they are the aggressors. You know, Ellie kills a lot of very innocent people that are not even necessarily in her way. You know, sometimes it's just like they're inconvenient. Dogs were trained to do this exact thing, uh, and so you're killing an innocent creature. The fuck's that? Fuck! Fuck! Ah! Got you. They should have heard that. That feeling of discomfort—it's exactly what we're trying to explore with with The Last of Us. Ironically, making them more realistic. Dude, the stuff dripping off the wall. Look at that. I never noticed with that the before. Last of Us. See that? Oh, ironically, God. making them more realistic makes people feel more okay about killing them. We had like kind of a goofy art prototype. We had like a, just a very rough dog. We found that that goofy dog that had no fur, people felt really bad about killing that dog. Like when you would shoot them, they would fall over dead and like give one last whine as their like dying breath and stuff. So uh, we just really tried to like tone down the pity ability of, of all the dogs and stuff. The best sound in most games are the stuff you don't notice. The foley in the game is extremely detailed. Things like foley are very easy to get wrong and noticed for the wrong reason. Very difficult to get right. But when you get it right, no one's going to pat you on the back for it. Yeah. Audio guys are kind of a different breed. We listen to everything all the time. It's kind of a curse. Our ability to use pre-recorded assets from a library that's like commercially available has been diminished uh, almost entirely because we we have very specific needs. Do you want more of those?
We're trying to take what we did in the first game and bring it to another level of detail. Yeah, play, play with that a little bit. Like, mixing that tonality in is cool. Yeah, yeah. The enemies themselves, especially the infected, have had to go through a review process. In the first game, they're pretty coarse. They're basically like on or off. They're either walking around mumbling or they're freaking out trying to get you. And so now we've we've developed sort of this like murmuration breath system that allows them to have a much more natural flow between being agitated and not. A big part of those recording sessions is is working with the voice actors. It's much more collaborative. <gasps> yeah, that's cool. Um, I, I kind of want to see what your more natural voice sounds like. You're basically trying to coach people that they're not zombies. <laughs> yeah, now imagine, now imagine sprinting. Ready, gotta crack. No, that oh, was yeah, cool, dude, man. Yeah, take your time, man. That's, that's, that's great. That's really great. One of the folks that we worked with, the sounds he was able to generate from himself was unlike anything I've ever heard before. Gnarly sounding roars and breaths and wheezes and really interesting stuff that I've never heard come out of a person ever. It's a very obscure talent, but a good one to have, I guess, in this very particular instance. <laughs> Sound is, uh, we're inherently post-production on a lot of this stuff. We kind of just have to be jamming and we have to be as prepared as possible and that's what we try to do. A lot of stuff is yet to come for us, which means there's not a lot of time left, which means that it's gonna get really intense. It gets really intense for everybody, but for audio in particular, um, we'll be here late. Yeah, I'm sure that's one of the last things I bet. I think that, I don't know if it's the whole studio, but I know I'm definitely feeling very tired right now. Um, I'm feeling a little burned out. <laughs> I'm realizing that I can't crunch like I used to. I can't put everything I have into um, these games as much as I was able to when I first got here. It's pretty unanimous that this, this game is really big, where it's bigger than we'd like it to be. The Last of Us Part 1 is small compared to this game. My argument, make the game small again. I don't even call them small. There were times when I was writing like 40 pages of in-game dialogue a night. Neil kept saying, stop, you have to like give it to somebody else. We will hire somebody, we will make this work. And I was like, I think it'll just be, <laughs> I was just bullishly like, we're gonna handle it, I'm tough. I would like somebody to teach me how to have work-life balance. There are some times where I wish I had uh, somebody in production or a big brother that could be like, no, 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 go home. This is great. This is already great. You don't need to do the next thing. I feel like at any given point, you'll go into the kitchen and you'll find people, what I would say, saloning about the game, like going deep philosophy into what's working, what isn't. People criticizing this or that. This doesn't look good. I don't like this scene. This doesn't work for me. I hate this. You know, like they're going to lunch and like expressing doubt to each other and like, is this gonna come together? Is this the one that like screws Naughty Dog up? Let me just exude whatever confidence I have left. Let me try to bestow this person with it so they can feel inspired and go off and do their work. But then sometimes you're alone in the office and you're like, what if this doesn't come together? What if this is the one that sucks? What if this is the one that, that sinks Naughty Dog? So then you have to like kind of bury it, compartmentalize it. Who knows what damage it does to your body while you're doing that? Because ultimately, you can't let that fear dictate how you work and just keep the faith.
Primary filming on this project ceased December 2019 due to COVID-19. Following interviews were recorded in 2023, looking back at the push to get the game out. Too bad they shut it down, but I guess they were all working remote, probably. Didn't really make sense <laughs> to like try to film Zoom calls. The game was just about done, was content complete. We were fixing bugs when there's these like rumblings of this pandemic happening. Like I remember when this COVID hit, hit and we're like, bro, really? Like for real pandemic? You know, at first it feels like, oh, it's this is nothing we need to worry about. And then all of a sudden you do have to worry about it. And like, are people gonna wanna play a game that takes place in a pandemic when there's a real pandemic? It was very topical. I'll give him that. We had never worked from home ever. It, like, it, Naughty Dog was actually strictly against working from home. We did not have the infrastructure set up at the studio to work from home. And it's because we were so intense about security and leaks that all of our data, including our emails and our chats and IMs, it all had to be on a server inside the building. Fifteen point three terabytes, baby. We were like air gapped from the outside world. The operations team, the IT team, our engineering team—they all had to coordinate in a very short period of time to get us working from home. We don't even know when the game can come out. Sony was like, "We don't know if we can physically ship this product with like the supply chain and stuff." We had to come out and say the game it can come out on this date, and we don't even know when it will come out. It's delayed indefinitely. Yeah, I remember that. Everyone was like, what What does that even mean? What do you mean delayed indefinitely? Because like now we look at it and it's like, oh, we'll just release it digitally, whatever. But even in 2020, there were expectations, a lot of expectations for physical releases. Collector's editions had already been sold. Like you couldn't just assume that you could ship all that stuff because you have to worry about the people in the warehouses. You have to worry about the people manufacturing it. How do you ship it from presumably being manufactured in mass uh, in China and then ship it over here and then distribute it through the States and then ship other sections to like Europe and Asia. Like, it's just not as simple as, no, it's fine. We'll just figure it out. Like it, it was a big question mark because for a while, a lot of things were shut down. There was no packages being processed. Everything was at a standstill. So a lot of our most hardcore fans are angry with us. Around the same exact time, we started having these leaks. We're like, we didn't put out this video. Like, where is this coming from? <laughs> it's a video from one of our reviews. So you could hear the notes and um, people that can't attend the meeting can watch it after the fact. Mm, we store all these videos on our server. Did it come from the inside? Someone with a Naughty Dog? My first thought was, this isn't like a developer leaking this, isn't it? This isn't someone on the team. It's this person in the Netherlands downloaded terabytes of videos through a back door in the server. And then this is where we made a fatal error. Let's close this back door. And then this person put out everything. A video goes up on YouTube, and I don't remember what the first video was, but it was something relatively benign. But they weren't like super important scenes. You know, they were like little clips, and it was like, okay, that's a little weird. What, what is that? All out of order and stuff. And I was like, oh, oh, that's bad. And you kind of wanted to just say, stop, 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 wait, 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 don't, don't, don't watch it. Like, you're gonna ruin things for yourself. There's YouTubers I've watched for, for years, and they're making entire videos, and the title is like, fuck Naughty Dog and fuck The Last of Us Part Two. There's just all this negativity and no positivity because no one has played the game. They just have these videos out of context and all these rumors mixed with them. Abby is playable. They thought Abby was trans because she has muscles. Here's the ending of they kill Ellie. And then it just turns this whole political thing. Oh, Night Dogs, oh, they're doing this political shit. And then I get this text from Evan. They just posted Joel's death. And my heart sinks. I can't even describe this feeling. It's just this like, dread it's almost like you just heard someone you care about died i don't know that's the closest i could i could come to i thought Choi would be looking at that be like you see you see you were wrong he said do you think we did the right thing and i said i don't know neil i haven't played the game yet i was livid i was i was real angry 
So I decided to go. <laughs> I, I decided to go then and find a collaborator to work on an NFT project with me. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a deep cut. Uh, no, I, I can only imagine the like pure levels of pain that must have come from it. Like you've been working on something for years and years and it's like a pretty high stakes thing. It's got to be presented right. Like anytime there's anything this heavy, like the char uh, the death of a character everybody knows and loves, that has got to be handled with much aplomb. And if you don't like, of course, people get very disrespected. Exhibit A, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League with Batman and the Flash and pretty much all of them. Um, when they're handled kind of sloppily and it's it, it, like not necessarily leaked directly before the, the game's launch, it's not received super well. But these leaks just can cause so many, so many issues. I wonder if they're going to describe who did it or if they figured it out. Because my understanding is they tracked who it was and it was not a disgruntled employee uh, but I don't know if they'll say it. I'm bombarded with hundreds of negative comments, death threats, anti-Semitic comments. It's putting me in a deep depression. There's some stupid stuff that's like, you're a feminazi, you're whatever shit like that. But it's like some stuff was really like, you know, disturbing. The hatred, I think, that was behind it. I was sad. Like, there were a lot of days where I would just cry. Every time I went online, it was just, that's all I saw was death threats and threats of violence. And the worst of it, the really like hardcore death threats got passed along and um, they, you know, made sure that they weren't anyone that like lived close by. <laughs> um, yeah, they were like threatening my son, you know, who was born during all of it. And you know, it was rough, it was rough. But, you know, more than anything, it just kind of like, it kind of like taught me to kind of keep a distance, you know? Yeah, what a pathetic troglodytic thing to do to threaten the life of a voice actress's child because you didn't like a plot decision in a video game. Like how bafflingly stupid is that? I mean, as you guys know, I've dealt with my fair share of things recently, um, like a swatting in mid-November, you know, there's been a handful of other things that I've not made public on various recommendations. Uh, but there's there's been things that have gone on and I, I can only imagine on the scale that these guys were dealing with it, it must have been unbelievable and just baffling to go from like working regularly, working from home, dealing with the pandemic and everything one day to all of a sudden dealing with all this crap at the same time. Like, oh, I can only imagine like whether this you like the four and a half years, whether you like the narrative decision or not, like hopefully we can all agree that that is insane. Like you can just be like, eh, I don't like it. I'd rather they didn't or they did it differently, whatever. That's fine. But going to the success, it's unbelievable. It's just baffling that anybody would do that. Years on, it's kind of getting violated. And then for two months before release, there's like nothing you can do. You can't release the game sooner because it's not done yet. And that was the lowest point in my life. <laughs> I'm working on the game towards the end at home by myself, feeling very alone. And I said, who am I doing this for? Like, why am I, why, this is, it's too much. And I barely squeaked by. And then we were able to finish it. And, you know, we sent it to reviewers and reviews are through the roof. called Troy and I said like dude I'm sorry I feel like I, I failed you and uh, and he's like what are you talking about and I'm like yeah I just know how some people talk I was like oh dude I don't care I played the game and I love it and I got really emotional it's like I, I realized how much I care about Troy caring about the game and that that was 
a huge sense of relief. There's not a single aspect of the game, part two, that I would change. And anytime someone comes up to me and says, you know, I didn't really like what they did to Joel. I was like, great, awesome. Tell me a better version of the story. And to this day, they still can't. My recommendation has always been tied up in pacing. I, I've broken this down before, but like, I think that there were some potential issues with the leaks that, of course, with hindsight, make it kind of difficult to figure out what would have been the best option. Because we can now say like, well, you should have done it this way because with context of the leaks, people were triggered already and were upset about how this was presented in that way. But I, I always thought that it didn't really make a lot of sense how contrived everything was that Abby just kind of wanders in uh, to the outskirts of Jackson, runs into just so happens to be Joel and Tommy. And then Ellie happens to stumble into them in the middle of like a blizzard. And all this stuff just happens to line up because that's exactly how they needed it to line up. I was like, I, wouldn't it make sense to also bring like for Abby and maybe her crew to infiltrate Jackson and try to figure out who Joel was and then plan like a, a, a kind of jump on him all at once. And then there's a reason for Ellie to know who the crew was, she knows them by name. She knows what they look like, what they act like. Maybe they could share details of their story and their background. You could also take the opportunity to like build relationships between Ellie and some members of the group that she then turns on and decides to go chase down. There could be some really interesting things done there. More than anything, I think they also could have streamlined the length and the rhythm with which you went through the game. Cause I feel like the first three hours are kind of a cluster of just chaos that doesn't actually flow very well. And then the last section of the game really, really, really is, is a trudge to get through. I think there's also a, a remarkable lack of levity in, even in the last of us part one. And I think perhaps the best example of levity being introduced in a really dark story in this context would be the left behind DLC. There were some really funny moments and cute moments in that story that shook it up and broke it up from this monotonous draining thing because the last of us part two if you've never played it is a marathon of misery i mean it really will just drain you emotionally by the time you're done with it you're like thank god not that it was bad but because you're just like i need a break i gotta go cry like it was just so much so much so i think they could have done some stuff to maybe limit the scope tr like trim it down uh a little bit because it just gets overwhelming by the end but all told like i get what he's saying like Okay, so you don't kill Joel. What's the story about then? What's what's the concept? You know, you just wanted a different game. That's all. That's all. And I do agree. There's a lot of people that are like, I didn't like how how they killed Joel. It's like, so how did you want it to happen? Like with him fighting Abby and then getting popped in the head or something? Like, it, it. I don't know. The whole premise of the game is that you have to hate Abby enough to chase her down, and then they flip perspectives and make you realize that maybe you could understand why she would hate Joel and hate Abby, or Ellie, rather, after Ellie goes and kills all of her friends, including a pregnant uh, expectant mother, which is pretty bad. That's pretty bad. I Dare I say that's on the level of killing Joel. I understand, like, she didn't necessarily mean to kill Mel and she didn't know Mel was pregnant when she killed her, but still, that's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Bad Ellie. It was a traumatic experience for myself and many people on, on the team. And the kind of hate we got because of those leaks will stay with me forever. And I can't even describe how angry I was of what the damage this person did to us. I want them punished in every sort of way. I wanted this to be this really, this villain. <laughs> And this person is like, you know, in their 20s or whatever. They live with their parents. And it's a fan. And then when we delayed the game indefinitely, that's, this is what they said, is like, I wanted to force Naughty Dog's hand. I wanted to force them to release the game. So I thought if I just put out all the videos, eventually they'll put out the game, which again was never an option for us. And I remember sitting there, sitting in my anger, and then go like slowing down and just saying, okay, if anybody should take the lesson from Last of Us Part Two, it should probably be us. Just let it go. A guy living at home with his mom was responsible for all of this. I'm a huge Pearl Jam fan. Really? Yeah, I know. So shocking to many people. What a fascinating way to 
tell a story. It's just getting better and better all the time. And I really appreciate the way that Future Days was used, um, especially bringing Joel and Ellie together, uh, connecting through music. It was cool to be part of it. So uh, thanks for having me and enjoy the rest of the show. How lucky am I? Like, how cool is this? This person that I've admired since I was a kid is now, like, mentioning this game that we all made. And then we started winning award after award after award. I wanted that validation for the team. Everyone at Naughty Dog, I, I can't wait to hug and high-five and get drunk with each one of you. Uh, that's going to have to wait till next year. And more than anything, and I know that I speak for the whole team when I say this, We'd like to thank our friends and family that stood by us and supported us throughout uh, us making this game. You inspire us not only to make better, more meaningful games, um, but to improve how we make games. Spring of 23. The pandemic kind of brought up that question of like health and mental health. Are we developers that are gonna stay at the studio and have full uh, careers. How do we make this sustainable? I, I like I chuckle in retrospect, just how absurd the failure of trying to alleviate crunch was. If you have great processes and you're super organized, that doesn't fix crunch. What that does is it allows you to make a bigger game. We read the postmortem feedback for The Last of Us 2, and it was really, really upsetting to see what co-workers had gone through. So we were highly motivated to try to figure out how to fix it. Everything about our workflows were already being upended with remote work and everything. So it's like, okay, well, yeah, this is, we gotta do this now. And we knew that to make the real changes we did, it would take the entire studio working together. We now have the goal for Nidoc to eliminate crunch. The only thing that fixes crunch, the only thing is just deciding that you're not going to crunch. Uh, when we onboard people, we tell wow. them, you know, we have a reputation as a studio for crunching, and it's something we don't want. And it's something we're not going to do anymore. First, we had to do, what them. is crunch? Let's let's define it. Because th when you just look at hours, that, that turn out to be too simplistic. It's a multitude of factors. It's not just like one thing. It's not just, oh, because of this, this is what's causing crunch. It's literally like so many of these little things. How do we get, make sure no one at Naughty Dog burns out? You know, every couple of months, we send out a, a, a 90 second questionnaire that goes, are you worried about your workload? Are you worried about having to work overtime? If you feel like I'm overburdened with work, you have to tell somebody. We used to, as a studio, when we were getting close to shipping a game, bring in dinners for the whole studio. We now they bring their own. <laughs> don't do crunch dinners anymore. Being able to work from home. Um, That's a cool statue. It's hugely helpful for me, from my mental health. Of like, you know, my daughter's there, my, my wife is there. Hybrid is, is really the sweet spot because I think the benefits have just been enormous. In the past, our leads, our managers, were the people that were best at their craft, but not necessarily the best managers. So we created the role of principal. We really gave people the choice, like, do you want to make stuff or do you want to lead and manage? And Arnaldo is now a lead designer here. Now I'm responsible for a team and I really enjoy that and being able to share that knowledge and kind of work with someone, even if they're more experienced than me, and it's been great so far. We have a very large and robust production department now that we, we didn't have. Wow. Holding us accountable when we make a decision, when it's just everyone going, yes, more, yes, better, yes, polish, 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 um, tallying that up and going, okay, well, this is the result. Now you're not in your ship date anymore. It feels so much like a different studio. I hope that we Good can keep changing for the better and make sure that we're making the games that we want to make, that we're really passionate about, that we don't stop doing that. We want self-driven, healthy designers. Yes, we, we exactly. want to have it all. We want to have it both. And, and can we do that? That'll, that'll be the question, I guess. Good for them. So that's been a concern for a long time was just the crunch. It was so toxic and something that plagued them so much. But to now be like, no, we're just not going to do it anymore. Good for them. That's how you do it. That's how you just cut it. 
Cut it. Um, and this could also explain why we haven't seen or heard anything. Like we previously been like, well, we got Uncharted 4 in 2016, then we got Lost Legacy in 2017, I think. And then The Last of Us Part 2 came out three years later in 2020. They used to be able to pump these games out, you know, like four years between the big releases, three years between the last little thing and the big thing. Like, that's pretty good. That's pretty good pace. And now it's been like going on four years and there's been nothing. Yeah, they've been working on an online game, but there's been nothing that's actually been released. Uh, and we haven't even seen trailers or anything. So where is it? Like, is it still four years out from here? Because they showed off The Last of Us Part Two, I think in 2016 was the first reveal. So, you know, it's been a minute, been a minute. So uh, it's it's definitely very, very interesting to see how it all breaks down. You know, like it, it, it seems like they're just approaching things fundamentally differently, which is causing probably timelines to shift and change. But that's if that leads to a healthier environment for everybody, good on them. The HBO's thing has been a wild ride. I just wanted it to be like good. Like, dude, if it just comes out and it's a good show, like that's that's gonna be huge. I'm sure it will be very different when I actually see Abby being portrayed. That will be so weird. I can't imagine what Ashley and Troy must be feeling. Specifically because Ellie is a part of my heart. In some ways, it was really hard. I feel like Bella was the only person who could play her because I feel like she is Ellie. There's a part of me that's like weirdly protective of her. I remember when Neil I'm also told surprised me how well she did as we Ellie. found Joel. I was like, he wasn't missing. Um, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, he goes, Pedro Pascal. And I went, oh, we're bulletproof. It felt like Craig and Neil together saw that this was a, a story about humanity, and they made it a story about humanity. We got Frank. Who knew that was waiting? Craig's screaming from the sidelines going, I did. When Neil and Craig asked me to play Ellie's mother, Anna, um, it made me so happy. And I'm crying, so it doesn't seem like it, but it was symbolic in so many ways to me. Being able to sort of bring Ellie cool. into the world, be the first one to fight for her, It breaks my heart. It felt like on the other side, we could get the story to people that will never play a video game. My mom is watching the show and like, she can enjoy this story and she can be a part of it. And she's so excited and working on season two and, and getting to see that. <laughs> Just hanging out. I love this quicker. idea <laughs> that someone could watch the show and then realize, wait, that's based on a video game? and come back and check out the game and then realize, oh, there's like all these rich games, triple A, indie, and all sorts of stories that are really unique to this medium. Future days, our future days. I did some other interview where someone asked me about The Last of Us and would there be any more stories or something. And I, and I mentioned like, you know, we have written a story that takes place after Last of Us 2 um, that stars Tommy and I hope one day we get to make it. And the headlines across the industry were like, um, Naughty Dog has outlined Last of Us Part Three, And that's actually wrong. It was, always, it was always a small story. It was never like a full title. At the time, we had higher priorities than Naughty Dog was like to fix our pipeline, to fix work-life balance issues. Just based on where we were, I didn't want to prioritize the story, so that story was shelved. And I still believe one day it will see the light of day. I don't know if it's, it'll be a game or a show, TBD first game had such a clean concept of like the unconditional love a parent feels for their child. The second one, once we landed on this idea of the pursuit of justice at any cost, justice for the ones you love, it felt like, oh, there's a clean concept here and there's a through line from the first game about love. If we never get to do it again, this is a fine ending point. And right, last bite of the apple, the story's done, 
the great thing about working at Naughty Dog is that we don't have to. Um, it's always like, we would love another Last of Us, but if you guys feel like we're passionate about something else, we'll support this other thing. Very privileged position to be in. I, I, I never take that for granted. I've been just thinking about, okay, is there a concept there? And for now years, I haven't been able to find that concept. Uh, but recently that's changed. And um, I don't have a story, but I do have that concept that to me is as exciting as one, as exciting as two, um, is its own thing and yet has this through line for all three. Uh, so it, it does feel like there's probably one more chapter to this story. Eventually, in many years down the road, uh, I, I hear that and I don't think that this is happening anytime soon. I know right now the headlines everywhere are like, Last of Us Part 3 confirmed. I don't get that from that statement at all. Like, I, I, I really don't. I would love for it to be what I got from that statement. No, um, I, I see that as an example of him saying, I have an idea for what could work as a story, but if where and how that lands, I'm not sure. So we'll see. I think right now they're working on some new IP. It sounds like they probably weren't ready for like full production stuff until 2021. And then they were working on the online game for a while. It's unclear how many people were working on it, but at least a while. Um, for at least a while, there were a lot of people at Naughty Dog working on it. And then they just shelved it this year, I guess technically late last year, um, I think is what it was. And they've shifted work and now they're doing something else. I also think there's no mistake that they've been doing a lot of like remasters and remakes. And apparently the reporting has been that the remakes and remasters are directly uh, an attempt to train new hires. It's been like their project to get like their feet under them. So I wouldn't be surprised if something similar happens there where maybe we get one more like reworking or maybe The Last of Us Part Two Remastered is the last thing that they've, they've worked on. And now everybody's moving to this full production on this other thing that they have in the works. And we're going to see that relatively soon. It'd be really cool if in the summer we get a look at whatever they're working on because it should have been enough time to see at least a concept trailer or something like they showed in 2016 with The Last of Us Part Two. But it could be because it's a new IP, they really want to have more there. They want to have gameplay to show they want to really be able to present something crazy and you know i can only imagine if the last game was still to this day stunning visually and in terms of gameplay imagine where they're at four years later with the ps5 at their disposal like i can only imagine what they're doing but i'm excited i'm excited so good for them eliminating crunch hopefully that ends up being true and accurate crazy documentary super super cool i was hoping for more like nitty gritty details on the the iterative process that's more of what like god of war ragnarok did um they didn't really it seems like they cut around a lot of the interviews with the actors and actresses unfortunately i would have liked to see that i was hoping to hear discussions of like some of the the doubts within the team about the story because i'm sure some of the lower level designers were questioning some of the narrative designs and decisions that they made but um, all told, pretty cool. It's definitely one of those documentaries that are designed to like pat themselves on the back and to be like, yeah, we're awesome. But like, if anybody deserves it, it's probably Naughty Dog. They are world class for a reason, for a reason, for sure. But whatever your take on the legacy of The Last of Us Part Two, hopefully this documentary gave you like more of an appreciation of how these games are made and what goes into making them. And um, it, it makes you appreciate it, even if you don't necessarily love how it turned out or the the premise of the story hopefully at the very least you can appreciate the work that went into it you know like i don't personally like gin it makes me feel nauseous when i even smell it but i can appreciate the work that goes into making a good gin you know like i can appreciate that so uh with all that said though i'm gonna call it there because it's like 10 p.m so i'm gonna call it Thank you for watching, hanging out with me through this whole thing. Um, you guys are fantastic. Thanks for making my dreams a reality. Much love. I'll see you soon. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye. He took my thing.